Nag-addict na po tayo. House Rules and Reminders Participants are automatically muted upon entry to give everyone a pleasant learning experience. Use earphone or headset for better audio. We encourage you to hide your video and close some of your tabs or apps to save on bandwidth. This webinar is recorded. The attendees grants consent upon registration. In case you have any concerns while the webinar is ongoing, you may send a message to CPBRD admin in the chat box or in the event Viber group. Kindly accomplish the online survey form after the webinar. Instructions will then be given in claiming your e-certificate of participation. Copy of presentation materials and highlights of webinar proceedings will be posted on our website at cpbrd.congress.gov.ph. Q&A instructions. You may post your question in the chat box while the presentations are ongoing. If you want to ask your question in person during the open forum, please use the raise hand function so we can include your name in the queue. Please wait for the moderator for the prompt to unmute yourself. We will try to answer as many questions subject to the availability of time. Welcome to CPBRD. The Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department's mission is to provide ideas, policy advice, technical assistance, and information support in the formulation and oversight of socioeconomic legislation that promotes sustained inclusive growth. In pursuit of its mission, the CPBRD shall foster a culture of responsiveness, professionalism, and excellence. Our vision is to be a recognized congressional think tank for policy and institutional reforms. The CPBRD's functions are the following. Assist in the formulation of legislative agenda of the House of Representatives. Provide analysis on the Philippine Development Plan. Undertake analysis of the impact of legislation. Research and in-depth studies on identified policy issues. Provide the House leadership and members with technical information on important social, economic, fiscal and institutional policies. Provide technical assistance to the speaker and the House panel for the Legislative Executive Development, Advisory Council or the LIDAC and other interagency committees. Collaborate with research institutions and development partners, both private and public sectors for knowledge sharing, policy dialogue and capability building. So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner. 
seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget, or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. House Rules and Reminders Participants are automatically muted upon entry to give everyone a pleasant learning experience. Use earphone or headset for better audio. We encourage you to hide your video and close some of your tabs or apps to save on bandwidth. This webinar is recorded. The attendees grants consent upon registration. In case you have any concerns while the webinar is ongoing, you may send a message to CPBRD admin in the chat box or in the event Viber group. Kindly accomplish the online survey form after the webinar. Instructions will then be given in claiming your e-certificate of participation. Copy of presentation materials and highlights of webinar proceedings will be posted on our website at cpbrd.congress.gov.ph. Q&A instructions. You may post your question in the chat box while the presentations are ongoing. If you want to ask your question in person during the open forum, please use the raise hand function so we can include your name in the queue. Please wait for the moderator for the prompt to unmute yourself. You will try to answer as many questions subject to the availability of time. Welcome to CPBRD. The Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department's mission is to provide ideas, policy advice, technical assistance, and information support in the formulation and oversight of socioeconomic legislation that promotes sustained inclusive growth. 
in pursuit of its mission. The CPBRD shall foster a culture of responsiveness, professionalism, and excellence. Our vision is to be a recognized congressional think tank for policy and institutional reforms. The CPBRD's functions are the following. Assist in the formulation of legislative agenda of the House of Representatives. Provide analysis on the Philippine Development Plan. Undertake analysis of the impact of legislation. Research and in-depth studies on identified policy issues. Provide the House leadership and members with technical information on important social, economic, fiscal, and institutional policies. Provide technical assistance to the Speaker and the House panel for the Legislative Executive Development, Advisory Council, or the LIDAC, and other interagency committees. Collaborate with research institutions and development partners, both private and public sectors, for knowledge sharing, policy dialogue, and capability building. So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. Need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget, or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published, 
Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Therapy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Lesson day, everyone. Please be advised that our public webinar on assessment of the criteria used in determining LGU fiscal viability will start in five minutes. House Rules and Reminders Participants are automatically muted upon entry to give everyone a pleasant learning experience. Use earphone or headset for better audio. We encourage you to hide your video and close some of your tabs or apps to save on bandwidth. This webinar is recorded. The attendees grants consent upon registration. In case you have any concerns while the webinar is ongoing, you may send a message to CPBRD admin in the chat box or in the event Viber group. Kindly accomplish the online survey form after the webinar. Instructions will then be given in claiming your e-certificate of participation. Copy of presentation materials and highlights of webinar proceedings will be posted on our website at cpvrd.congress.gov.ph. Q&A instructions. You may post your question in the chat box while the presentations are ongoing. If you want to ask your question in person during the open forum, please use the raise hand function so we can include your name in the queue. Please wait for the moderator for the prompt to unmute yourself. We will try to answer as many questions subject to the availability of time. Friends from the Legislative Department, Local Government Units, and the Research Community, good afternoon. Welcome to our public webinar entitled Assessment of the Criteria Used in Determining LGU Fiscal Viability. By now, we already have 243, 254 participants in the Zoom room. To start the program, let us respect, pay respect to the Philippine national flag as the national anthem is being Play. A short invocation will follow. Bayang magibiw, ernas ng sinanganan, alak ng puso sa dinig mo'y buhay. Upang hihirang buyan ka ng magiting Sa manlunopig di ka pa sisiil Sa dagat at punok sa simoy at sa langit mong bughaw May hilag ang pula at awin sa paglayang minamahal Ang kislap ng wataw at mo'y nagumpay na nagliningning Ang bituin at araw niya kailan pa may di magdidilim Lupa ng araw ng luwalahat at pagsimba Buhay ay langit sa piling mo Aming ligaya na pag may mga ating Ang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo Let us 
call to mind the peace prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me be the first to pardon. Where there is doubt, help me to encourage faith. Where there is despair, let me be that beacon of hope. Where there is darkness, let me reflect your light. Where there is sadness, help me to become the bearer of everlasting joy. O Divine Master, grant that your servant may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Again, good afternoon, everyone. This knowledge sharing event is organized by the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, or CPBRD, and the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS. The objective of today's discussion are one, to share the PIDS findings to a wider audience, especially members of Congress, House Secretariat, congressional staff, and other stakeholders. And two, to generate inputs for legislation which seeks to improve the distribution of fiscal transfers and assignment of functions across different levels of government, that is, the national and the local levels of government. This event is also broadcast live via the PIDS Facebook page and YouTube. Snippets of the program are also posted in the PIDS Twitter account. Thank God for modern technology, we are able to bring knowledge to a bigger, to a bigger virtual venue to benefit a greater number of people. To deliver the opening messages, let me acknowledge the heads of the two organizing institutions. Dr. Romulo Emanuel Miral of the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department of the House of Representatives, and Dr. Aniceto Orbeta, the President of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. We will hear the opening message of Dr. Miral first, to be followed shortly by Dr. Orbeta of PIDS. Sirs. Good day, everyone. Let me welcome you all in today's uh, webinar, jointly organized by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department. It has been a while since we had our last webinar with PIDS. That was uh, prior to, to the pandemic, almost two years ago. We are very glad to resume this joint collaborative activity where we are able to provide a venue for the presentation of scientific policy-oriented studies of PIDS and an opportunity for interaction between the authors of the studies and our legislators and their support and technical staff. We may not have any legislator joining us today as they are very busy in their campaign. Nonetheless, it is an opportune time for the Secretariat of the House to have this webinar as we start preparing for the 19th Congress. Part of our technical assistance to the members of Congress is to provide research inputs to the formulation of the legislative agenda. This consists of uh, identifying the major issues and constraints to the development goals of the country and the corresponding policies and programs to address them. Uh, in connection with the topic of today's webinar, the 1987 Philippine Constitution has adopted and mandated local autonomy and decentralization as a goal and means of promoting development. We have the local government code enacted in 1991 to carry out this constitutional mandate. However, as various studies have pointed out, the result of government decentralization in the Philippines is at best mixed. Some degree of administrative and political authority have indeed moved from the national government to local governments, and some LGUs have had remarkable accomplishments. However, the desired overall qualities of local governance, namely efficiency, responsiveness, and accountability, have not been attained. 
I believe that a major and binding constraint to the overall effectiveness of local governance is our highly fragmented local government units. Let me share with you some figures that would help us appreciate more the importance of our webinar topic today on the fiscal viability of LGUs in the Philippines. Uh, and yes, uh, I, I call these figures uh, from a report of the OECD on subnational governments around the world. Among selected countries of the Asia Pacific, the Philippines is second only to India in terms of the number of subnational governments. Note that in the report and in this table, municipal government refers to the lowest government level, which in the case of the Philippines consists of barangays. The regional or state refers to the level of government next to the national government. In the case of the Philippines, this consists of the, of the provinces. As you can see in the table, the Philippines has the highest number, uh, the, has the second highest number of uh, uh, subnational governments. And uh, from the table, you also see that uh, the Philippines uh, uh, has, um, if you compare, for example, to China, which has a population that is 14 times more, and a land area that is 32 times bigger than the Philippines. It has less than half the number of provinces compared to the Philippines. India is also 13 times more in population and 11 times bigger in land area, but also less than half the number of states. And in Southeast Asia, Indonesia is uh, 2.5 times more in population and 6.4 times bigger in land area compared to the Philippines, but also less than half the number of provinces. Most countries have also two subnational government levels, but the Philippines has three. Um, the Philippines has the highest number of intermediate subnational government units consisting of municipalities and cities at 1,564, which is way above higher than those of other countries. In short, uh, the Philippines has too many LGUs, but not only that. The number of LGUs in the Philippines keep on increasing or multiplying. Do we really need that much number of LGUs? Are they all financially viable? What can be done about this? These are some of the questions that are addressed by the PIT study conducted by Dr. Justin C. Catiocno and Dr. Vicente Paqueo that will be presented in today's webinar. We will also have a chance to hear comments from uh, Ms. Sandra Tablan Paredes, Executive Director of the League of the uh, uh, Provinces of the Philippines, and uh, Mr. Nino Raymond Albina, Executive Director of the Bureau of Local Government Finance. We would like to thank our resource person and everyone attending this webinar for sharing uh, their valuable time with us as we look forward to a very informative and lively knowledge sharing forward. Again, and thank you. Uh, Dr. Miral, uh, guests, colleagues of, from government, academe, uh, civil society, media, the private sector, online brewers on the PIDS and uh, SERP Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Today, we focus our discussions on the fiscal viability of local government units or LGUs. Implementation of the Mandana's ruling this year gives LGUs additional powers to deliver devolved goods and services to the public by increasing intergovernmental fiscal transfers. Through the Department of uh, the Interior and Local Government or DILG, the national government prepares LGUs for full devolution this year. There are concerns about uh, our LGUs capacity to carry out devolved functions effectively and efficiently. Some experts have also recommended that LGUs first boost their uh, capacity to carry out development projects. Otherwise, there may be problems in implementation of certain functions. Given the greater responsibility and funds assigned to the provinces, cities, and municipalities and barangays, revisiting the rules on establishing LGUs is critical. Since 2019, 
the National Economic and Development Authority or NEDA and the Senate of the Philippines called for a look into the fiscal viability of uh, our LGUs. Similarly, it is beneficial to know whether existing rules create LGUs that effectively deliver on their mandates. For years, PIDS and the House of Representatives Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, or PBRD, have been working hand in hand in engaging policymakers and legislative staff to discuss key policy issues. Selected uh, PIDS studies are presented at the House of Representatives to this PIDS CPBRD joint seminar series. Like Dr. Miral, I am pleased that we are reviving the series today through this joint webinar. PIDS is honored to partner with CPBRD in uh, the pre presentation and discussion of PIDS study entitled An Assessment of the Critical uh, Criteria Used in the Determination of the Philippine LGU Fiscal Viability authored by PIDS Research Fellow Justin Joknosikat and Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow Vicente Paqueo. This study examined the fiscal implications of the current criteria for establishing the fiscal viability of local governments in the Philippines. It also tested the impact of the current fiscal viability indicators, explored other government uh, governance and political economy variables on local revenues and expenditures. Dr. Sikat will share their findings on the current state of development among LGUs in the country and how the rules on their establishment possibly impacted their performance. She will also provide some recommendations on improving the government assessment on LGUs fiscal viability. Before I end, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our discussants, the League of Provinces uh, of the Philippines Executive Director Sandra Tablan Paredes and Bureau of Local Government Finance Executive Director Nino Raymond Alvina for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to hearing your insights on the topic. Thank you. I now give back the floor to the moderator. Okay. Sorry for that technical glitch. Again, thank you, Dr. Miral and Dr. Arbeta for providing context and setting the tone for today's event. For information, we now have 330 participants in the Zoom room and counting. For some administrative procedures, may we request participants to submit their questions in the chat box while the presentation is ongoing. Those on Facebook Live can also post their questions in the chat box. Please indicate the name of the presenter and or the discussant to whom you want to address your question or comment. Should you wish to ask question personally, please use the raise hand button so we can, we can put you on queue. Knowledge sharing to inform public policies and decision making has long been an engagement between the CPBID and PITS. Today, we will tackle the paper done by Dr. Justin Jokna Sikat, together with Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow, Dr. Vicente Paqueo. Dr. Justin Sikat is a research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Her credentials include a PhD in Business Administration, a candidacy for PhD in Economics, an MS Management, and an MA Economics degree, all from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Dr. Sikat's academic and professional experience covers public sector economics, fiscal and monetary policies, and the political economy in general. As former professor at UP Diliman, she taught courses on the same subject matter. She is also an international consultant in areas of public expenditures and financial management, both at the national and local government le levels. Currently, she sits as the president of the Philippine Economic Society. Let us now hear the presentation of Dr. Justin Jocknasikat on the assessment of criteria used in determining LGU fiscal viability. Okay. Thank you so much, Dina. Good afternoon, everyone. 
And I'd like to thank first and foremost the CPBRD, uh, primarily DSG Jun Miral, Novel Bagsal, um, Director Pam Manalo, and all of those who helped organize this at the CPBRD, as well as our counterparts at PIDS, the RID team of Sheila CR, and of course, headed by Dr. Uh, Babes Urbeta. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the, our, my, fellow, my discussants this afternoon, um, Sandra Tablan Paredes, as well as E.D. Nino, uh, Nino Avina, who was actually my former student. Uh, I'd also like to thank my co-authors, of course, uh, Dr. Vic Pacquillo. At the same time, I'd like to thank those who helped out in the study. Uh, Ms. Angel Castillo, Rixi Madawian, uh, Robert Palomar, and Ms. Lucy Melendez. So this afternoon, I'll be sharing with you uh, the results or the highlights, rather, of our study that discusses the assessment, uh, an assessment of the criteria used in the determination of Philippine LGU fiscal viability. Now, there are two ways to create the Philippine local government. This, is, this could be through an act of Congress or by a local ordinance in the case of a barangay. The criteria used to determine LGU fiscal viability is in Administrative Order Number 270, Series 1992, and these are verifiable indicators of viability and projected capacity to provide services. And I'd like to underscore this provide services. And these are namely LGU income, population, and land area. Now, since the passing of the Local Government Code of 1991, the criteria used to determine fiscal viability of LGUs, meaning to create, convert, merge, or abolish, with the exception only of component cities, which was revised uh, through RA 9009 in 2001, has remained the same. Now, what are the possible implications of this uh, as an introduction? No. This, is, this could result in LGUs that are unable to provide above basic services, plain and simple. Given the current state of varied development across LGUs, which might be compounded with forthcoming increases in transfers with the Mandanas ruling. Second, as um, Dr. Meral mentioned earlier, and thank you for sharing the, the international uh, view of fragmentation of SNGs, no? subnational governments, it could give incentives for lower level LGUs to level up. The current distribution of intergovernmental fiscal transfers within the same level LGUs, i.e., that part which is equal sharing poses an incentive for lower level LGUs to want to level up to get larger transfers. From 2001 to the present, the changes in LGU structure was there was about 68% uh, 68 new cities created, about 46.9% of all of the, the changes in the PSGC. Uh, 25 new municipalities were created, 1.7%, and 107 um, or 03 percent barangays were created. Now, Still on the, the, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be showing you varied capacities across local government units, which impact the ability to provide uh, devolved basic goods and services, including the inability, evidence would include the inability to consistently and some to ever receive the seed of good local governance, uh, varied infrastructure gaps across regions and varied outcome indicators as well across regions. Now, these are the research questions and objectives. Is there a need to redefine fiscal viability in the establishment of Philippine local governments? How does the Philippines define a fiscally viable LGU? This must first be answered in our study. How was this affected? How has this affected the delivery of devolved goods and services? And are there any other possible criteria or ways to determine viability? I understand that in 2017, there was already an effort with um, House Bill 6177 to to um, revise the LGU income requirement, which is what the study really focuses on. Um, this was passed at the House of Representatives, but I'm not sure um, where it is right now. Um, now, to examine how the current criteria to assess fiscal viability in, in the LGUs can be approved on, the study will examine how the fiscal viability of local governments is defined, will show the fiscal impact on LGUs of current criteria, and explore other indicators and or criteria or adjustments in current criteria that could be used to establish LGUs. Now, this is the next slides will just show you uh, the very development outcome indicators across regions. What we tried in the study was to identify the outcome indicators that could be best um, identified with performance at the local government level. So this would be based on the devolved 
services, such as in the case of health. Although it's not entirely the responsibility, of course, of the, the LGU, this is a devolved function. The national government also has a, a part to play in terms of infant and uh, maternal mortality. But in 2019, this is just to show that there are varied performance across the different regions. So this would show you NCR on the top and BARM. So this would be on the in the first graph here, infant deaths per 1,000 live births. So you would see it's high for NCR and, and low for BARM. And this would show you maternal death rate per 1,000 live births. So this would be NCR. The highest would be for the Karaga region. So this is just to show varied development indicators across LGUs, which is, could be possibly part of the impact of the inability to provide devolved services. Now, this one is based on a recently published article of ours in the Philippine Journal of Development, which we look at the governance and regulatory issues in the, the delivery of local water services. So here, this is also based on the PWSMMP of the, of the NEDA, the Water Supply and Sanitation Master Plan. Uh, the information there. So this shows you the percentage of households with water services by region. So this would be BARM, rather, CAR, NCR, up until region 13. And though there have been improvements from 2011 to 2016 in terms of access to potable water, so this would include levels 1, 2, and 3 no? uh, water systems, um, this is also varied across regions. Now, in 2020, we published a uh, a study, which was the baseline study on local government support fund assistance to municipalities, wherein we identified fiscal and governance gaps in terms of devolved local infrastructure services that still received assistance from national government, um, from national government programs. And these focused on identifying the fiscal gaps in municipal roads. So it was a survey of 1,373 municipalities. Municipal roads, uh, rural health units and primary evacuation centers in GDA areas. And what we found was that there was a fiscal gap of about 167 billion based on existing infrastructure in 2017, which I'm sure now um, has, has would have changed already what, what the fiscal gap would have been. Now, what this slide shows us in, is that in the case of the municipal roads that were existent in 2017, we estimated there was a need of about 133.3 billion to pave 100% all the existing roads in 2017. So in 2017, we did an inventory, we asked, we did an inventory of municipal roads and asked um, the surface if this is paved or unpaved. And the aim of DPWH at the time was to pave all uh, roads by 100%. So that's how we estimated the fiscal gap. And it's also to show here that there are varied um, performance indicators when it comes to municipal roads. We did the same for uh, primary evacuation centers, but we focused only on municipalities with geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. Um, uh, we asked how many of these municipalities had GDA areas that did not have yet a primary evacuation center. And we found that the gap um, depended on what was needed because it depends on, you know, structure, how many rooms, um, water supply. But we estimate the range to be about 2 to 12.2 2 billion based on 488 GDA municipalities without primary evacuation centers back in 2017. Okay. Now, finally, we also asked, um, we also tried to estimate the fiscal gap of rural health units based on the policy of the HFEP program of the DOH to have uh, one RHU per 20,000 population. And our estimate was that there was a fiscal gap of about 1638, which would range depending on the specifications. There are standard costing per these now from 17.9 billion to 21.4 billion. So this is just to show, again, there's varied um, outcome indicator performance and infrastructure in terms of the devolved services. Uh, services that were already devolved uh, back in 1991. Now, let's go to the crux of the matter. What is fiscal viability? Uh, it's the general ability of local governments to provide local goods and services. It is determined at a point in time where there is a move to create, convert, merge, or abolish a local government. So really, there is no thin, you know, strict line between the definition of fiscal viability and fiscal sustainability, but how the literature would typically define fiscal sustainability would deal primarily with the ability to pay off debt, 
um, in the case of local governments. But um, Box and Solquist in 2004 and 1996 suggested that it assumes that an LGU that is existent requires and requires that over the long run, the growth of spending does not exceed the growth of revenues. So, so this is a, a very tall order. This would actually be hinging on self-reliance, which is actually in section two of the local government code, as we know. But, but this definition has expanded the definition, original definition of fiscal sustainability, which focused only on the ability to pay off state debts. So what we will be doing is we'll be looking at how the Philippines defines fiscal viability um, at the point of creation or um, conversion of a local government unit. So that's what this summary table shows here. So in the first column, you will see what are the fiscal viability uh, criteria or determinants. So as I mentioned earlier, this would be income, which is defined to be minimum average annual income for the immediately preceding two consecutive years. Okay, Then we would have the minimum population per inhabitant, and then we would have the minimum land area. But the focus of this particular study is really the income requirements. And I just want you to to you know to take a look at this now. This is divided across the different levels of local government. So we have provinces here. We have cities, which is divided by component cities and uh, highly urbanized cities. And then we have municipalities, mm -hmm. and then we have barangays. For barangays, there is no minimum average. The only would be the in the inhabitant requirement or the number of the population. But in the case of provinces, HUCs, and municipalities, the income requirement has not changed since the implementation of the local government code of the Philippines. So this is in 1991 prices for you to be able to put to create a province, you would just need 20 million pesos. You would have to show proof of 20 million pesos of your, your income uh, of that of the collection of municipalities or barangays to be able to create a, a province. But we tried as much as we could to rebase now from 1991 to 2018 prices, but it's hard. Um, so we'll have slight errors, but but the 20 million pesos for provinces would be roughly about 73 million in terms of in 2018 prices. Okay, so we tried to convert the series from 1991 to 2018. So that's how you should should see this. In the case of component cities, I mentioned this earlier. This requirement was revised by um, uh, RA 9009 in 2001. It it amended Section 450 of the Local Government Code, increasing the requirement uh, for for the creation of a component city to 100 million in 2000 prices. But the, but but the odd thing is that um, the HUCs and and you know uh, the HUCs is still the requirement is um, 50 million pesos in 1991 prices. At least that's how we've read the the laws. No? So this would be equivalent to about 183. Uh, million pesos uh, in 2018 prices. And what is surprising is, and which is our highlight, is the municipality. So the requirement to become a municipality, uh, uh, the income requirement is 2.5 million in 1991 prices. So according to our rebasing, it is roughly about 9 million in 2018 prices. And later we'll be using this to compare it with with the, the expenditure requirements that we have identified in this particular study. Okay, now have these criteria been sufficient enough to ensure provision of essential government facilities and services? So this is just a summary of the section 17 devolved services in the local government code, no economic services, social services and other services. And this is, there's a more detailed matrix of this right now as everyone is preparing for the um, devolution transition this year until 2024. So NBM Circular 140, I think it was last year, or 138, the National Budget Call, already identified a more detailed um, list of services that would be redevolved to local government units. Um, and we know not uh, why. Well, I'll be discussing it later on. But in a nutshell, um, LGUs are not self-reliant in the Philippines. They're highly dependent on intergovernmental. It's common in the literature, but um, I'll be discussing that in more detail later on. Now, for the case of uh, the theoretical framework for this particular study, we look at the literature on decentralization and on the optimal size of government. So 
fiscal viability is really part of the broader issue in decentralization, which is the optimal size of government or the local or subnational government in this particular case. Uh, OTA 1972 proposes that if there are no cost advantages or economies of scale with centralized provision, then a decentralized pattern of public outputs reflecting differences in tastes across jurisdictions would be welfare enhancing as compared to a centralized outcome characterized by a uniform level of output across all jurisdictions. So this would justify bringing uh, the delivery of goods and services that can be directly identified to local constituents or benefit the local constituents closer to them. Um, in practice, this has been translated by bringing governments closer to the people so that the goods reflect preferences of the voters, but balancing this with economies of scale with higher levels of government. So I'll be discussing some economic principles behind decentralization and federalism briefly later on to, to show what this exactly meant by this. Some local public goods and services have spillover effects, so it would be beneficial for these to be provided by higher levels of government or inter-LGU arrangements. Now, what is the evidence on decentralization and the optimal size of government? Internationally, finding this balance between assignments has resulted in over-fragmentation. So multiple tiers or levels of government, which impacts the ability of these local governments to deliver goods and services. Now, solutions have been to encourage integration or amalgamation of local governments into larger units to become more efficient in service delivery and also take advantage of economies of scale like in the case of water systems, sometimes it would be beneficial for several LGUs because of the huge sunk costs involved in such infrastructure to cooperate, to provide uh, water supply more efficiently. Now, other solutions use, um, re recommend the use of horizontal or vertical cooperation or creation of special districts or an additional layer of governance to provide for goods and services that cross boundaries. Okay, now just briefly, these are the economic principles on intergovernmental fiscal relations, and they deal with identifying the principles behind the identification of expenditure assignments, as well as revenue assignments. So in the first column here for expenditure assignments, of course, it would be economic, it would be more efficient and increase the accountability of local chief executives. If you bring the delivery of public goods and services that benefit immediately the constituents, um, closer to them. What would be an example of this? Um, uh, the garbage collection, that would be it, or um, street lights. Those are examples of public goods and services that really directly benefit the local constituents. Now, there are also challenges and considerations in the expenditure assignment with regard to internalizing externalities, as we call it in economics, or the spillover effects. What are these? These are public goods and services such as local roads, which cross boundaries or water services, perhaps irrigation also. And in the case of others, let's say for hospitals um, or RHUs, sometimes one neighboring municipality might offer better uh, health services than the other municipality. So nothing would stop uh, someone living from another municipality going to that um, municipality wherein that person is not a resident. So these are what you call externalities and spillover effects in the case of local public goods and services, which might actually require a higher level of government or coordination across several uh, inter in, uh, LGUs. Also in the assignment of expenditure responsibilities, economies of scale in both administrative and compliance costs must be considered. My example earlier was, let's say the establishment of a water district. It might be beneficial for several municipalities to cooperate in this. So politically, this is a different question. Economically, this is what might be more efficient. And uh, let's say the redistributive and equity function of government, this would be, uh, in the case of the, typically this should be left to the national government, especially when it comes to income redistribution. An example of this would be, let's say the four piece program, which I heard from the SWD in the, the devolution transition plan, it still would be absorbed by the, national government, but there are some that um, social welfare programs, which I think LGUs are already implementing, such as for the uh, AX, uh, assistance to individuals in crisis situations, and PWDs, you already have your own uh, version of this, these programs. So these will be left because you can better identify your constituents and who needs um, assistance at your, at your level. So, so that, that would be one of uh, the principles behind expenditure assignment. When it comes to revenue, 
Bottom line, uh, let's say increase of taxation, the mobility of factors of production such as land, labor, and capital should what be what is what is considered. Um, local governments would typically be assigned responsibility for taxation of immobile factors such as land and properties because this one you cannot pick up and leave uh, a local government unit to evade to avoid the tax. Okay, that's why real property taxes are assigned to to local governments because the the factor of production cannot you know it, it it's immobile it cannot be moved now administrative costs as well as redistributive costs are also considered in revenue assignments now what is the international evidence when it comes to the optimal size of governments and let's say fragmentation well decentralized countries vary in the determination of the number of levels of governments and the the slide showed by dr Merrell from oecd would would be evidence of this now Evidence also shows that higher fragmentation is more costly due to poorer expenditure management. The inefficiency in the delivery of services with an overfragmented government has led central governments, such as in Canada, um, in recent years to reconsider organization and structures of the levels of government. In almost every instance, major municipal consolidations and amalgamations have been initiated or driven by senior levels of government with a major rationality generally being that of cost savings and improved efficiency. Many of these initiatives have been accompanied by offers of financial rewards for the restructured municipalities and, if not, and nothing if restructuring does not take place. Now on to the results of our, uh, our methodology and the study itself proper. The methodology, data and scope. So we use the mixed method approach, uh, including descriptive and regression analysis using a combination of secondary and primary data. The, the, the baseline study, which I mentioned earlier, we published in 2020, we have uh, you know, a unique cross-sectional municipal database, which we combined with other um, information and data from other government sources. Now, we have two approaches um, to this study. Uh, we do a regression analysis to determine the relevant, uh, relevance still of the existing criteria. And then we also do an exercise trying to estimate the cost of devolved function. This is challenging because there are different priorities across LGUs, but what we did was we tried to estimate the staffing uh, complement, the HR, how, human resource complement. How much would it cost to fill all of the LGC mandated positions? And that was our you know, approximation, preliminary approximation for the cost of devolved functions. Now let's see some stylized facts here. So these three slides here shows that, okay, um, we have here provincial income distribution, municipal income distribution, and city income distribution. What we see is that it is only cities that could typically finance all of its spending. And what do we mean by this? If you take a look at provinces, there are two columns here. The blue column represents the proportion of local services compared to the proportion of external services, um, sorry, of local income sources compared to the proportion of external income sources. So as you can see here, um, provinces are heavily dependent on external sources, which is primarily comprised of the internal revenue allotment now we know as national tax allotment. So that would be the trend line here on top. Okay, so we're just superimposing it here. The same story for municipalities. Okay, local sources are the blue column here. And external sources are the gray column. So the uh, external sources get, get a larger proportion of municipal LGU income. And the trend line still is that it's ERA. That is the primary source of external sources because we also have shares from national wealth and, all, and, and, and others. But it's really the NATA or the ERA. You see a different story when it comes to cities. So it's this, the income distribution of cities here you still have the blue column being local sources of income, uh, which would be tax and non-tax. And then the green column would be external sources of income. So the external sources of income, again, is ERA. And what we see is that um, by large, cities are more capable of raising um, revenues to finance uh, their, their, their spending. Okay. So th this is just a summary. I'll just skip this. No? Uh, it, compiles, it compiles provinces, cities, and municipal income distribution. Now for this one, this shows you the expenditure distribution depending on the four major sectors, uh, uh, general public services, economic services, social services, and then we also include capital investment expenditures here. As you can see for provinces, ex 
municipalities and cities, uh, general public services, which is the cost of administration or the bureaucracy, would get the largest share, yes. But in the case of provinces, they spend more on social services, while you would see more spending on capital outlays, especially for cities. Okay, uh, this is just a summary of that particular structure. Now, this one is very interesting. We just did an exercise. We looked at the share of um, provinces and municipalities. Their, I can't see. Uh, they could raise, so this is the local source income, okay, um, to two factors, right? Okay, one would be local source income to LGU expenditures. And one would be uh, local source income to what we define as devolved functions. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Devolved functions, we just excluded education because it's primarily centrally, it's still centrally provided and debt. Okay, so this is the total expenditures of LGUs as the denominator, two kinds, no? Devolved functions, meaning net of education and debt. And then the other, including everything, current operating and capital outlay expenditures. So we looked at local source revenue, so local source income no, as a proportion. And what we find here is that provinces and municipalities are able to finance only about 25 to 28% of their expenditures through, through local sources. For cities, it's not the case. You can see almost 100% here. So cities are in a better capacity as well. Now, for examining the relevance still of the current criteria in establishing fiscal viability of LGUs, what we did was we looked at um, the impact of these criteria on local revenue raising performance and expenditure determination. So we conducted benchmark regressions just using ordinary least squares and fiscal and socioeconomic data, all from government services, except for the primary data that we collected. So this is a reduced form equation based on best day and case in 1995, where G here would be either, it's a, a fiscal policy indicator. It's either total local revenues or total current operating expenditures. And then the explanatory variables or the viability variables we find in the local government code are population, land area, and LGU income. And then we have also, so the hypothesis are that population, land area, and LGU income, or its proxy municipal poverty incidence or LGU income class, should be so positively associated with um, both local revenues and current operating expenditures. And for the last two, uh, this would be negatively associated with local revenues and expenditures. Now, Vector ZI contains other governance and political economy variables, such as the presence of updated development plans, this is, though this is based on 2018 information, and investment programs, as well as years of office in, of the incumbent mayor. We have information of this, as well as the, the receiving the award of the Seal of Good Local Governance in 2017. So we use these um, other variables as, as explanatory variables. Now, what are the regression results for total local revenues, which is the left-hand side? So we're trying to see, okay, which of these variables are significant in the determination of total local revenues? So what we found was that population and the seal of receiving the seal of good local governance in 2017 had a positive impact on local revenue. So as population increased, and if that municipality received the SGLG for that particular year, there it was associated. Okay, we're not we're not establishing any causation, right? It's just associated with uh, increased local revenues. Land area and municipal poverty incidents, however, were found to be negatively and significantly related. What does this mean? As land area increased, it was found that it was expected that local revenues would, would decrease, while as poverty incidents increased, of course, it was also expected that local revenues would be lower. So that's, uh, those are the local, those are the findings for uh, the impact of the fiscal viability criteria and other variables on local revenues. So we also did the same exercise for current operating expenditures. Okay, the significant variables were population, land area, uh, current operating income, and SGLG, as well as the schedule of market values, the updated schedule of market values, if it was updated in that year that we conducted the survey. And this is where it's surprising. The schedule of market values updated did not figure in in the local revenues, but it did figure in in current operating expenditures. So perhaps there's something that we still have yet to capture. Something's happening there. But in any case, it's nice to see that, well, 
as population and land area increase, of course, yeah, it's expected that current operating expenditures would increase. But the same thing with current operating income. Of course, as it increases, you would be expect higher expenditures. Same thing, seal of good local governance, if they received it in 2017, the year that our survey was conducted and for which most of the cross-section data was dated, uh, there is also a positive association with uh, current operating expenditures. So they might be in a better capacity to spend because they received the seal of good local governance. Remember, well, most of you was... Some of you here might be local, uh, you know, local officials uh, that that know that uh, satisfying the requirements of the SGLG would mean that you would be able to to to, to deliver a certain level of governance as they estimated. Now, income classification was negative, okay, and this was also found to be robust. What does this mean? Um, this means that while income class as income classification increases so it becomes six no it's associated with uh, lower spending so what that means is that that's fine because uh, lgus are classified from 1 to 6 so the higher you are that means you're poorer okay the only governance or political economy variables that were significant are the sglg and the updated schedule of market values although this one was only in the case of uh, local not local revenue, sorry, this should be local expenditures. Yeah, so there's an error there. Now, what's the importance of updated schedule of market values? Well, this would ensure a larger uh, or a more up-to-date tax base, okay? Now, these are the results. I won't go into them. This, uh, the slide earlier was just a summary of it. Now, I want to go on to this one because I have only five minutes left. Now, what are LGUs mandated to spend on? Well, ideally, in deciding the fiscal vi viability of LGs, it would be good to estimate the cost of devolved basic services. The though fiscal autonomy allows varied LGU priorities, local government code mandated positions are the same across LGUs, and therefore it would be easier to estimate um, a good candidate to approximate the cost of the human resource complement to implement devolved services. So what we did was based on the positions prescribed in the LGC, classified as elective mandatory or optional, and the DBM manual position or, or classification and compensation, as well as the salary standardization law of 2019, we did an exercise. How much would it cost if we decided to fill all positions? We have two models. The first would be the elective and the mandated positions only, that's model one. And then the second model was model one plus the optional positions. And for each of the positions, we put at least three in that particular division. So in this case, these are the elective officials. So you're allowed to have a mayor. The salary grade is 28. The monthly salary, according to the SSL, is 142,683. But the thing is, um, according to salary standardization law, uh, depending on your LGU income class, you can only max give a maximum salary of a certain proportion of what is allowed nationally. So we estimated that also. So for the elective officials, this is what it looks like. For the mandatory local official, appointive officials, this is what I mentioned, we put three persons at least. So for the department head, the salary grade maximum would be 24. Assistant department head for accountancy, 22, and then you would have the salaries, and then there would be next highest. So we put at least, we staffed with at least three persons per um, mandatory local appointive position. And what we came out with, okay, so this just shows you um, what I discussed earlier, what we came out with was the municipal human resource complement estimated cost. So the total cost of filling LGC mandated positions by LG income class in million pesos for the model one would be for the first class about 44.4 million a year. To. This is annual. For the sixth class, it would be 29.6 million. For model two, it would be model one plus optional positions. So this would be about 67.1 million. And for the sixth class, this would total about 40.4 M. So this is a far cry from the income requirement of what we approximated to be 9 million to become a municipality. So what we did was we just did an exercise. So this, is, this table shows you the proportion of the income requirements we established using model one and model two to three different denominators, okay? Total local source income, total LGU income, and total expenditure. So in, in the case of LGU source income, let's say the, the income requirement 
for a first class municipality to fully uh, staff elective and mandatory is about 60% of its local source income. It's 16% of its LGU income and 20.8% of its LGU expenditures. So you're fine here, right? You can still afford it at first class. But when you go down, let's say for model one only to the fourth income class, actually you're still in pretty good position. Remember that the maximum PS cap would be 45% to first to third income class, while it's 55% to fourth to sixth income class. So it's the fifth, income classes and lower that would be in trouble when it comes to model one but in model two it's only actually the first class that would be able to finance let's say um all of its you know about 31 percent of spending and still stay within the local government mandated ps cap okay now this one <laughs> this is even Larger. So the fiscal gaps I described to you earlier as a proportion of the same indicators we described. So these are in proportions. So let's say for the first income class, we estimated the fiscal gap for uh, local roads, rural health units, and um, evacuation centers to total local source income of the first class LGUs, and it was about 254%, 1,000%. Okay, so just the last two slides, if you will indulge me. So what are the general um, findings? Well, there's strong evidence in the need to revise the minimum requirements of LGUs to minimize the issues of fragmentation or there being a larger number of LGUs that struggle to deliver devolved basic services. Increasing the minimum LGU requirements would make it more challenging to become an LGU, therefore reducing fragmentation. Furthermore, redefining average income to be those locally raised would make it more stringent for LGUs to, to level up. Now, there could be an asymmetric approach to ensure self-reliance across levels of LGUs by reducing the subsidies received, let's say, um, but I know this would be politically challenging. Now, what are the recommendations? Amend sections 442 and 461 of the local government code to increase the minimum income requirement, allowing the, cre allowing the creation of municipalities, provinces, and HUCs as well. Uh, given the existing number of municipalities, what could be done to ensure improved delivery of services are the following. Encourage amalgamation or cooperation across different LGUs for certain functions that have spillover effects. If amalgamation or cooperation is a challenge, the good or service that has cross-boundary effects could be assigned to a higher level of government. The uh, studies estimates for the LGU human resource complement are just a starting point for determining the the uh, the LGU income level wherein a municipality should be deemed as fiscally viable. Okay, future studies could be the review of the NATA distribution as well as enhanced inter-LGU cooperation. So these are my references and thank you very much. Looking forward to um, the discussion presentation. Indeed, the study done by Dr. Sikat is of interest to all of us, not only as policy analysts and researchers, but more so as constituents of our respective local government units. Thus, we invited to LGU finance specialists to give their views on the issue at hand. With us today is the Executive Director of the League of Provinces of the Philippines, Ms. Sandra Tablan Paredes. Ms. Paredes has dedicated 35 years of service in both private and public sector, particularly in the Legislative Department under former Senator Joe Lina. She also served as consultant to the ILG, DNR, in the City of Manila under then Mayor Lito Atienza. Ms. Paredes holds the distinction of being the first executive director of the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines, or ULAP, since its inception in 1997 up to 2005. Concurrently, she served as executive director of the League of Provinces of the Philippines, or LPP, from 1996 to 2005. She regained her position as LPP executive director in 2016 up to the present. In June 2020, she was appointed as member of the CHED Technical Panel for Public Administration and will serve as such until June 2024. Director Paredes completed her bachelor's degree in economics as a dense lister in UP Diliman. She is currently pursuing his Juris Doctor degree at the Ateneo University School of Law. Her main advocacy at present is protecting the gains of fiscal and local autonomy of LGUs, particularly in ensuring the correct implementation of the Supreme Court ruling on the Mandana's Garcia petition. 
right after Ms. Paredes, we will hear from the Executive Director of the Bureau of Local Government Finance, Mr. Nino Raymond Alpina. Director Alvina is involved in policy formulation, implementation, capacity building, supervision and coordination of treasury and real property assessment operations of all provinces, cities, and municipalities. His previous works in the OF, BLGF, include property evaluation and taxation reforms, design and implementation of fiscal sustainability scorecards, fiscal performance standards for LGU, subnational debt policies, and monitoring. He was also involved in the professionalization of assessors and treasurers, including the DOF policy on standardized examination and training for treasurers. Edi Alvina graduated from the UPNC PAG and completed executive programs at fiscal decentralization from Sanford School of Public Policy, Duke University, and on Metropolitan and Urban Finance from Maron Institute of Urban Management, New York University. At this point, let me turn over the virtual microphone to Executive Director Sandy Paredes for insights on the paper of Dr. Justin Sikat and Dr. Vic Pacquiao. Thank you, Ms. Dina. First, uh, let me correct you. I'm a law student of uh, Arellano University School of Law, not Ateneo. I can't afford Ateneo. <laughs> uh, so to, to begin my um, presentation, I'd like to first also um, inform uh, Justin, there are also new provinces created since 1991. No? There are actually eight. I think it's a, it was uh, inadvertently um, uh, not mentioned. But uh, from 1991, uh, or prior to the code, there were only 73. And then Biliran, Gimara, Sarangani, and the others uh, were created. Um, and um, so far, no amalgamation or abolition of the provinces as of this time. I think also, uh, for the cities that you are in the island, Garden City of Samal and uh, Bacon and Sorsalan City. Uh, and also, well, recently Palawan was supposed to be split into three, Palawan, Palaw 2, and Palaw 3, you know, but it lost in the place. And also MNDA, uh, well, it's being referred to by BBM in its local budget memorandums as uh, the 82nd province, but of course, we have based our strong objections because there are already three jurisprudence of the Supreme Court saying that MNDA is uh, not, a local, not a local government unit and it is uh, under the office of the president. But it has unwarrantedly decreased our mandate of 23%. So it's, uh, we'll, be, we'll be questioning that with the, with the courts very soon. Also, Nomenclature, uh, the, the study of made references to the era, although there's a footnote there that's not national tax allotment. Madali naman tandaan, no? Natang, nataas na, natama na, natatagalan lang, no? But uh, re, uh, the phrase internal revenue has been deemed written off from that date the local government code was passed uh, pursuant to the civil code. And uh, this is, uh, I'm sure Nino will, uh, will show this also, but uh, let me just be, um, let me just point out the, the difference here. If you look at the BIR, no, uh, the DOF made a comparison between the uh, prior to the Supreme Court ruling, which is the era, and the, after the Supreme Court ruling, which is the NATA. And uh, if you look at BIR, our share from BIR collections actually decreased from 1934 to 1913, uh, thanks to the DOC revenues being included. And uh, so we have a 959 billion NPA for 2022, or an additional of 185 billion. And this is just 24% increase for the same year. But we are still also questioning this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, our position, the League of Provinces, led by uh, our national president, uh, governor Marinduque Governor just um, Presbitero J. Velasco Jr., uh, formerly uh, an associate justice of the Supreme Court and uh, the one who wrote the concurring opinion uh, for this decision. He is, uh, he has, uh, well, we have communicated our protest as to the reckoning date of the uh, implementation of this ruling, which is, which should be from the date of the finality of the decision, just from June 10, 2019, and not 
2022. You know, this is a right that we cannot waive. We cannot even condone because rights can be waived unless it's contrary to law. And this is a constitutional mandate and the constitution is supreme. So no matter how noble the intention is of the government, this is this is a national obligation that can't escape uh, to be, you know, this is a commitment. And uh, per our estimates, just from the collections uh, from the Bureau of Customs, uh, there is a shortfall of about 505 billion uh, although the, the 959 billion has already been committed by the national government in the GAA, we still uh, believe there is still a shortfall. Um, there's a shortfall of about 35 billion. Uh, so just to show you, uh, in fact, the, the Office of the Solicitor General, I, I, you know, I, I want to stress it at the onset because this impacts greatly on the fiscal viability of LGs. It has been undervalued for so many years. We're not all already collecting the 1.5 trillion uh, due to us from 1991 to 2019. You know, we have abandoned that, but uh, we are vigilant and we remain relentless in pursuing the prospective application from June 10, 2019. Thus, the OSG wanted to include in the dispositive that the adjustment begin in 2022. And what did the Supreme Court say? It denied that motion for clarification and in the and just Chief Justice Bersamin said that the adjusted amounts can be deemed effective only after this ruling has lapsed into finality. And when is this? This is on June 10, when it was uh, recorded in the books or the entry of judgment to be June 10, 2019. And the court just said, bahala kayo how you will implement it if uh, you know best, you know, based on the press politicas doctrine, they cannot compel the executive and legislative uh, as to how to implement the ruling. But the fact remains that the reckoning date remains at June 10, from June 10, 2019 onwards. So, uh, and for 2022, um, you know, prior to the local government, prior, prior to the Supreme Court decision, uh, the, we reckon about, there's only 3% deductions from the gross revenue, you know. But after the ruling, it increased to 16% deductions of the gross revenue, and they included these seven items. The block grant from BAM, about 67 billion, uh, that's like the ERA. It's a 5% block grant from the collections of customs and, and the BIR. Why should it take precedence over the LGU's NATA? Uh, it, it's on, uh, uh, the same footing. Why should it take precedence? It's not even a tax measure. And the Supreme Court said you can only deduct if such deductions are ba have basis in the constitution. And these are statutory fees. Uh, the NTA is a constitutional mandate. And so 87 billion, we lost 35 billion there in the process. Now, not, uh, I'm just, I just wanted to emphasize that because of the, our topic is fiscal viability. So on the policy question, Justine, you know, yes, na yes, there is really a need to redefine the horizontal and vertical. Just take a look at this. Prior to the code, the share of the provinces was 27%. But uh, this is based on the Manansan 207 kids policy notes. 27%. Uh, but the actual cost of devolved functions that uh, are assumed by the provinces run to about a high of 37%. And we're only getting 23% of the NATA. Uh, similarly, for the municipalities, uh, the cost of devolved functions are. Uh, uh, they carry about 38.5% of that. Pre-code, they were getting 41%. Now they're only getting 34%. Similarly, for the factors, the vertical sharing no, on population land area, it seems that, uh, well, pre-code, 70% population, 20 land area, 10% only for equal sharing. And it was increased to 25%. But, you know, um, on, the, in the, on the hindsight, the the equal sharing factor, uh, like for example, a, a small area like Batanes province, very, very uh, small population and land area. So their per capita income is so high because of the equal sharing. So it, it is uh, counterintuitive, you know, the purpose for which, which it was uh, changed may have been, you know, has to be revisited by Congress. And uh, this, I'm just showing, uh, I, I, I did this simulation. I, I took out all the nine provinces that has below 1 billion income based on 2020 uh, statements of receipts and expenditures. And uh, there are nine. Actually, there are 
uh, based on the uh, local government code requirements on the three factors on population, land area, and income. Actually, Justin, there are um, seven provinces. Ito, naka-highlight ito. Seven provinces which are uh, way below the codal requirements for land area and population. And there are about 20 provinces. Uh, itong seven, both. Both two requirements, they fall short. 20 provinces, uh, land area below 2,000 square, uh, square kilometer. And uh, 13 provinces below the pop population requirement of uh, 200,000. 200, uh, but all provinces are, are uh, compliant with the, the income uh, requirement. And the, the lowest nice is Davao Occidental at 171. So the 20 million top benchmark is way, way below. So it has to be adjusted. And uh, is there a need to redefine fiscal validity? Of course, uh, yes, may yes, din kami dyan, no? uh, But again, this is uh, the prerogative of Congress. Uh, we cannot do anything about that. You know, as so executive, we can just recommend. But ultimately, it's a political will. And, and the people will have to approve that in a plebiscite. Um, so, uh, on the fiscal viability, the study, uh, well, time and again, sinasabi, Ira dependent ang provincia at mga municipio. Of course, there's a need to raise local revenues because uh, if LGs are not physically viable to deliver the basic services, it defeats their very purpose. And so, uh, well, uh, we believe that uh, for the fiscal viability, number one, correct dapat yung pagcompute. Uh, second, the tax assignments and restrictions, it varies eh, for LGU. So, provinces, you know, that Justin said cities are more capable in develop, capable or physically viable in uh, delivering basic services. But it is because we don't have the same taxing powers that cities have. In business taxing, we don't have that. We don't even share in the income of the component cities. Um, so, there are unfunded mandates that take a toll on the fiscal uh, viability of LGUs. Um, the NTA will even decrease by 2023 because of lower tax collection. And the public programs, projects, and activities of NGAs are now being transferred or passed on. Sabi nga ni Jasin, really bold. And, and uh, Senator Chis, as former Senator Chis Escudero and the Governor Chis estimates, in nila ang GAA 2022, they, they surmised that it's about, it runs to, to a high of 1.2 trillion tops of PPAs that will be discontinued. So, nawalan kami ng 1.2 sa mga LGU. That's seven times the 185 billion increase in the NATA. So, that's very difficult. Uh, we're, we're giving expectations to the people that LGUs might not be able to deliver. Also, national government is highly dependent on the share from national taxes. One thing that I'd like to highlight uh, and take up the opportunity that Congress is here, the status of taxation. Sana ayusin na natin to because in the benefits uh, for Imperial Manila is really very detrimental. Look at this chart. This is 2015. Only the five cities got, uh, collect 30% already of the total local revenues at yung 99.7%. Pinagahatian na lang yan ng 1,699 provinces, cities, and municipalities. So there's really an imbalance. No? There's a fiscal imbalance. And uh, take a look at this. Um, I, I, I used already the 2020 statement of receipts and expenditures to compare the tax, the collections of uh, cities, vis-a-vis provinces on taxes on business. Because on city, look, what, 15 billion, 9 billion, Makati. Huh? Eh, tignan niyo naman ang probinsya. Top 5 na ito, 414 million. And, and you expect us, you don't compare oranges with apples. I mean, it, uh, the tax, uh, the taxing capacity of provinces, uh, it's really, it cannot be compared with that of the cities kasi malaki ang business tax. Although we really rely heavily on real property tax. Uh, well, I borrowed this uh, sa Bangsal study on this stuff. Ito naman, NCR really uh, collects most of the taxes because, well, 86% of businesses they're established here. The headquarters are here in NCR. And with the situs of taxation, 
uh, so of course, they collect the large taxpayers remit here uh, to the detriment uh, of the... It's not that tamad kami mag-collect ng taxes sa mga probinsya. Wala na kami mag-collect ng iba. The, the large taxpayers are here. Uh, so that should be really looked into. So is there a need to increase income requirements? Of course, but the legal provinces and the legal cities has asked for a moratorium for the creation because uh, it impacts on, on the fiscal viability of the existing uh, LGUs. Current, uh, ayan, ano? nabanggit ko na yan dati. And uh, on the amalgamation, uh, while we agree with the, with the amalgamation of LGUs to enhance uh, efficiency, Kaya lang, the political reality is that there's no political will to do that. The, there are also legal limitations. Our, cons, our very constitution provides for the multi-tier. Wala tayong magagawa unless we amend the constitution. Uh, and so, uh, on economies of scale, meron na tayong centralized procurement service. Diba? So, uh, we need to strengthen the regional development councils and then also implement the universal health care with the necessary resource concomitant resources uh, with it, um, and also the strengthen the supervisory powers of provinces uh, pursuant to the subsidiarity principle. And uh, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a large toll on the fiscal viability of our LGUs. On the optimal size, I say we are already presuming that uh, although we are so many, there are 43,000 LGUs, but the OATS, OATS uh, principle is we're, we're trying to build, to make government accessible to the people. So, di bali kung maraming barangays, tignan nyo ngayon COVID, sino ba inasahan natin ngayon kung di ang ating mga barangays? Um, okay, my last five minutes. Our proposal is to increase the revenues of the provinces. Sa amin na lang yung STL, bigyan nyo kami ng franchise power uh, so we can raise revenues. Uh, the STL grosses is 26 billion a year. Uh, and then there are Supreme Court decisions saying that PCSO cannot subdelegate its franchise to private entities like the AACs. That's what, what's their, what they are doing now. So on income classification, palita na yan, ni, Nino, ayusin na natin yan. Kasi tignan mo naman, itong basis ng Section 9, you have already the power to, cons to continuously uh, update the income classification. Look at the wordings of Section 9 to the proper authority, although you are recommendatory, but to the proper authority. But look at with, under what title it falls. It's administrative authority. So on statutory construction, the administrative authority, the Secretary of Finance, necessarily, that is the president, that is the proper authority, not Congress. Although Congress can pass the law, no? but you cannot expect Congress to pass law uh, based on the recommendation of finance every four years. Because the intention is so that they may continue to conform with prevailing economic conditions. So let's, you know, why, why, why do we have to uh, amend the income classification? Because ano eh, for the EO138, the financial assistance will be given now only to four to six. And it's highly inaccurate anymore. So on the full devolution, uh, of course, the general rule is on executive issues cannot amend the code, no? And for the transfer of NGA's POPs and personnel should be only optional, you know. This is in consonance with the constitutional provision and jurisprudence on control versus provision. So recommendations pass lang. Legislative action, kayo ng bahala sa Congress. We will support you, but also consider the dissenting opinion in, in the case of LCP versus Pomelec, where the court said that it should uh, be it should amend the code. It should not be just a special law and there is no express amendment of a specific provision of the code because that was the reason for the flip-flopping here. Uh, executive action, so update the income classification, moratorium on unfunded mandates, konti na lang ang aming prerogative, 13 to 23%. Ano sa pagka rami-raming uh, uh, percent dito, percent dyan, it's actually, uh, again, a hold back against the automatic release and we will be questioning this also in the court. Uh, soon. Uh, questioning na namin lahat yung 20%. If it is constitutional because uh, it's a lien, it's a hold back. It's uh, dapat uh, the local sanggunian should be the ones approving the budget of the LG. So we, uh, we appeal for more national and interlocal transfers, 
the growth equity fund is only 1.2 billion this year. Sana i-consider na ng Congress yung equalization fund as discussed by Manansan in her paper. Algo na wala na sa 2022 budget. Sana i-establish yung cost of devolved functions and personal services or codex which was discontinued by DBN 2017 during the time of your father. Sekita, I joke na. So give LGUs the just share, national taxes, national wealth, special shares also. And also we now have our own initiatives. Siyempre kami rin, meron din kaming uh, way to raise our local revenues by simplifying the structure of local business taxation, collect, uh, improve our tax collection efficiency, uh, to the use of technology, uh, update the schedule of market values. Gusto lang namin, Leo, itong nagbibigta sa amin kasi it's a highly political uh, issue that the if we raise taxes, real property tax, magagalit yung mga constituents sa amin, mga gobernador. So, kayo nang sasabihin namin, isabi ng BOF ganon. So, uh, also lessons learned, sana we should do, we should uh, continue with the bottoms up planning, which was the intention in the local government code. You know, there's really no one size fits all because different LGs have varying circumstances and, and their own prevailing conditions and they know what's best. They're the frontliners. Uh, they're the ones who should be left to make the proper decisions, which is the priority ones that they should handle first, you know, because in but local budgeting, it's a zero sum game. If we, we if we allocate a lot for infrastructure, it will be to the detriment of the other basic services. So the, right now we are too centralized, uh, you, know, you know, the NTA is only from an average of 15%, it's now 19% with the Mandana Suli. It's still way below the 23% average of subnational governance in Southeast Asia. And in Asia, it's even 34%. So, time to cut the umbilical cord after 30 years. You know, nagtaapo na ako dito sa local government uh, code, hindi pa rin naaamyandahan. And hopefully, uh, we can protect the gains of uh, LGUs in fighting for the fiscal and local autonomy and giving us just sharing our share. So thank you. So thank you. I turn over now to the floor to Nino. Okay. Um, I hope everyone uh, can hear me. I'm sorry, I don't have uh, a PowerPoint. Uh, to be shared but uh first i'd like to uh, greet everyone a very good afternoon especially to dr uh, miral the director general of uh, the congressional policy and budget research department of the house of representatives uh dr aniseta urbeta the president of the philippine institute for development studies to PIDS uh, research fellow dr justin jocnesica who was my professor not so long time ago and dr vincent uh, pajeo I'd like to acknowledge also here um, uh, Director Pam Diaz Manalo, uh, Deputy ED Dina uh, De Jesus Pasagi. Thank you for the uh, introduction, ma'am. Uh, to my co discussant, uh, ED Sandy of uh, the LPP, to officials of the PIDS and CPBRD, other think tanks and uh, researchers and guests in attendance today. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, CPBRD for this invitation. and. Uh, it's a privilege for me joining this webinar to give uh, comments and views on the assessment made on the criteria uh, used in determining the fiscal viability of LGUs uh, in the Philippines. Uh, perhaps as a direct link to the topic of the study, the agency that I represent, which is the Bureau of Local Government Finance, is an attached bureau of the Department of Finance that does the actual certification required by law, namely the, the Local Government Code of 1991 and RA 9009 when it comes to uh, income requirement for the creation, conversion, or abolition of local governments. It's, it's, it's uh, the BLGF that submits to the House of uh, Representatives and to the Senate of the Philippines the certification that the proposed LGU uh, really meets the income requirement for a specific purpose. So uh, certainly I received the invitation uh, with and the work that we do here in the BLGF, specifically on the recommendations on other fiscal viability indicators uh, that our policymakers uh, should consider. 
for this purpose, I have structured my uh, reaction or discussion uh, uh, in, in the three parts. So first, I'd like to uh, underscore the, the importance of fiscal viability vis-a-vis -vis fiscal sustainability. The second part of my discussion would be on how, how we actually do the income viability certification in the DOF and the BLGF. And third, our comments on the recommendations of uh, the study. So uh, for the first part, um, let me just go through my uh, notes. Um, I fully agree with the authors on the need to define uh, fiscal viability versus fiscal uh, sustainability. Well, for me, fiscal viability is, is the precursor, while fiscal sustainability is actually the continuum, since the goals of fiscal decentralization uh, are not uh, uh, achieved overnight. And we all know, as pointed out by uh, Edie Sandy, the development tracks of local governments are not uniform in speed and in quality, and more importantly, in their level of service standards and facilities expected from the government. Uh, I think as an important point, fiscal viability as among the criteria of uh, as, as, a, as among the criteria of jurisdiction size and uh, population as a function of urbanization is important in policy research and decisions for uh, amalgamation, conversion, creation, or even abolition of uh, local government units. Uh, that the level of fiscal readiness and financial capacity of an LGU will sh should be strengthened so that the administrative and political autonomies uh, of uh, the, the LGUs can be achieved. So that's the parang, for me it's very important that the foundations uh, should be strong in terms of the fiscal position and fiscal capacity of local government units. So it's very important for us to have these strong foundations to see to it that the devolved functions and services may be adequately delivered by the lower local government units as part of the fiscal decentralization agenda of, uh, of the government. Um, I particularly like the uh, estimation on uh, human resource requirement of LGUs in the study. And I, I would like to build on the findings and share what we have uh, seen so far uh, in our supervision of local finance uh, operations of the LGU. So when we tried analyzing the performance of local governments from 2017 to 2019 in terms of their PS limitations, which by the way, uh, was made using actual expenditures and not strictly on the basis of their budgets. Uh, you know, the basis for 4555 is to comply with uh, the budget uh, rules. So we looked at the reports of local treasurers uh, and uh, it indicated that some LGUs may be experiencing strain in their PS. For example, um, uh, if we just look at the numbers and not yet uh, on their justification or perhaps adjustments in accounting, uh, in the case of provinces, we have observed that on the average, 13 provinces experienced a strain in PS limitations, 20 in the case of uh, cities, and around 560, 570 in the case of municipalities. While there may be, um, as I have mentioned, uh, accounting adjustments made later on, the, on, on, on these uh, uh, strains, which eventually qualified uh, these observations to not actually uh, exceeding the limits. For us, these are signals that the creation of um, new and additional positions should consider the medium to long-term uh, requirements of, of that particular position or uh, office, even for mandatory uh, positions required by law. Um, in, in, in my experience, uh, some, some LGUs prefer designation of officers perhaps to save and for new positions uh, to be created, some LGUs could only fund uh, the heads or, or, or the positions, but not the other lower level staff and the cost of operate operations of the entire uh, office. So uh, as part of our program in the Department of Finance, we assess the fiscal sustainability within the parameters discussed uh, in the study by uh, Professor Justin. As I have uh, earlier implied that uh, fiscal viability may not necessarily yield uh, or, or lead to fiscal sustainability. So in, in, in the BLGF, uh, 
we look at the LG Fiscal Monitoring System, or what we call the LGFPMS, and assess the performance of LGUs according to uh, four uh, typologies. We have type 1, is the LGU good in revenue and good in expenditure? We have type 2, good revenue, poor expenditure. Uh, type 3, poor in revenue, but very good in expenditure. And type 4, both poor in revenue and uh, uh, in expenditures. We have around um, 20 financial performance monitoring indicators for these uh, typologies that are actually coming from the reports of our uh, LGUs. And uh, in the interest of time and uh, only for illustration, I think I can cite the case of uh, cities in 2019, where we saw 15 or 10 percent of uh, cities landing on the first uh, typology or with good uh, ratings for both uh, revenues and expenditures. More than half of the total number of cities at around uh, 59, 60 percent or 85 LGUs have poor revenue and poor expenditure uh, rating. So aside from these uh, typologies, we also have the LG Fiscal Sustainability Scorecard, which was um, uh, actually directed by Secretary Dominguez to be done annually for us to check on key fiscal and um, uh, financial performance assessments of LGUs. And uh, there, there are uh, objectives why we are doing uh, these uh, scorecards. Number one, we want to assess the individual LG performance uh, comprehensively. No, hindi lang sample uh, sizes, but the entire uh, uh, sets of uh, the, the entire uh, uh, LGUs, provinces, cities, and municipalities. Second, we want to provide active uh, uh, advice to the LGUs. The third would be to use this uh, data to support uh, uh, their decisions in availing a credit financing, and lastly to possibly support local and national policy formulation. Using six rating levels, so we rank provinces, cities, and municipalities uh, um, in, in six uh, classifications. Excellent, very good, good, uh, needs improvement, uh, uh, poor, et cetera. So again, just for illustration, in 2019, we saw 12 or 8% of cities having a rating of excellent uh, uh, remarks in terms of uh, fiscal sustainability indicators. But this actually is a decline from uh, 2018, uh, 16 in 2018, and 2017, we had uh, 20. Meanwhile, around 60% uh, or 86 cities have excellent to good uh, ratings. The remainder, around 59 or 41% of the cities, have average uh, to poor uh, ratings. So it's uh, through this scorecard that we disclose to each LGU our analysis. By the way, we write individually, uh, the mayor, the governor of the results of our, um, of our rating. Uh, and that includes the PS limitations that I have just uh, shared earlier and advice on how they can uh, improve on their fiscal performance and uh, reporting accountabilities moving, moving forward because we also check if they revise their schedules of uh, market values, if they submit on time their spending, uh, re report on spending and uh, uh, collections, and also the granular data on real property assessments. Uh, I think, um, on the other hand, uh, I must underscore also the study's findings that um, uh, corroborate the claim that LG income is not a sufficient condition to ensure the delivery of default functions. And as other, as also mentioned uh, earlier, uh, other factors must be considered, uh, such as um, planning, uh, capacity, the supply and demand in the locality, uh, among, among others. We have seen some examples of these uh, uh, cases where provincial governments create barangays or regional governments creating municipalities, but effectively, the services required for the people in the context of uh, subsidiarity principle could not be provided or adequately uh, met. Um, uh, Edith Sandy mentioned this uh, earlier, uh, our country experience actually shows that most of the time the leaning is towards uh, fragmentation or division, uh, uh, amalgamation for the purpose of creating new LGUs. With, uh, I think in the last 10 to 15 years, we have around 20 newly created or converted cities. Um, the the experience of uh, Island Garden City of Samal, for example, Dinagat Islands, 
Sharif Kabunsuan and uh, the, the, the proposed division of Palawan are interesting areas for study on fiscal viability. Uh, uh, we, we can do uh, individual studies at least. But in my experience, and noting the, the remarks also of Dr. Meral earlier, uh, he mentioned whether we really need uh, this much number of LGUs. Uh, I suddenly thought about it as we have not seen a case of reversal or downgrading of LGUs to lower local government unit as provided uh, under the code. This is something that I think uh, we can, we can uh, take a look at uh, for policy uh, research purposes, especially that in other countries, other country experiences that uh, pursued reforms in administrative uh, and uh, territorial uh, jurisdictions uh, reforms for purposes of uh, economies of scale and improving uh, fiscal decentralization have opted uh, uh, to, uh, to look or consider that, that action. So let me go now to the second point of my discussion, which is on how we certify the fiscal viability of uh, LGUs. So what we do uh, in the LGF and in the DOF um, are in line with the provisions under the local government code, section 7, um, 8, and 9, and uh, the requirements under uh, the amendments made under RE9009. So the DOF is mandated to attest uh, the income indicator in the creation, conversion, merger, or abolition of LGUs. In 2018, uh, the Secretary of Finance issued uh, Department Order Number 31, 2018, which provided uh, the rules and guidelines uh, in the certification process uh, relative to the requirement of uh, the LGC and 9009. So the BLGF generally does the certification for these requirements, but uh, we also note that uh, provincial treasurer and city treasurer are mandated under the code to certify the income requirement for the creation of municipalities and uh, for the classification of uh, a city into uh, an HUC, uh, respectively. So in the certification process, uh, the BLGF, and uh, concerned uh, provincial and city treasurers use the SRE. Uh, that was the reference also in the study and uh, mentioned by uh, Edi Sandy, or the statement of receipts and expenditures that are submitted by all local treasurers all over the Philippines through uh, our online portal called the ESRE, or the Electronic uh, Statement of Receipts and Expenditures. Uh, and we look at their reports for the last two consecutive years. And the four years prior, uh, to the issuance of the latest income classification as our basic data when we compute and attest the income requirement. I think we can have uh, a separate session uh, for, for on, on, on that topic, uh, but we refer to the CPI issued by the Philippine Statistics Authority as we also update annually the CPI factor based on the available uh, data released by the PSA. So what I'm basically saying here is that the year reference for the CPI and its ratio with the desired income level should matter. There have been recommendations to make it more current, but essentially the deflation process answers the basic questions. As of year 2000, can this municipality produce already 100 million pesos of locally generated income to fund the basic services and facilities and requirements expected of a city? So that's, that's, the, that's the basic uh, uh, side of it. Uh, in the presentation, Professor Justin mentioned about uh, the rebasing as of 2018. So perhaps I could share some updates here, wherein our recent data sets show the equivalent current average income level that an LG must have for 2020 and 2021 should be 84.6 million in the case of provinces with a requirement of 20 million under the law, uh, and that includes ERA. In the case of City, it's 221.8 million average, uh, whose requirement is exclusive to locally sourced income only, and 10.58 million for municipality, whose requirement is 2.5 million. These current amounts move annually depending on the CPI factors uh, that uh, we, we look at. As a possible scenario, and Edi Sandy also mentioned this, uh, uh, implied uh, about this earlier, we can actually determine from the existing LGUs how near or how far are they from the income requirements based on the thresholds, uh, the thresholds now for fiscal viability, or those that actually uh, meet the codal requirement now, as maybe leads for research of PIDS or CPBRD, as we um, 
uh, deepen the discourse on this very interesting topic. But we must bear in mind the codal requirement then when these LGUs were created. So the creation of LGUs from a lower to a higher level of local government, well, particularly for cities, is not uh, easy. For the past uh, five years, we have uh, processed 42 applications. I think uh, we have seven applications for provinces and 35 for cities uh, for their average uh, income, uh, of which 16 met the income requirement. And uh, I think only one or two have successfully converted uh, to a city through legislation. For certifications uh, uh, issued by provincial and city treasurers that, uh, that I have mentioned uh, earlier, we vet their certifications and confirm compliance with the DOF policy. And we also endorse the same to the DILG. For the uh, third part of my reaction, uh, we note the uh, study's conclusions that first, there is strong evidence for the need to revise the minimum uh, requirements of LGUs. Uh, second is to increase the minimum LGU income requirements to make it more challenging to become an LGU, therefore reducing uh, fragmentation issues. And the third uh, is to the option offered to redefine average income to be those locally raised to make it more stringent for LGUs to level up. So uh, number one, uh, uh, we note the, uh, the, the efforts, uh, uh, recent efforts to exempt or be lenient with the population and uh, land area requirements for the conversion and uh, or creation of LGUs that have been uh, supported by stakeholders, especially for those LGUs, uh, towns or municipalities with very good fiscal position that actually exceed significantly the existing uh, thresholds. Uh, somehow, this indicates that um, LGUs, uh, the, the LGUs conversion is likely welfare uh, enhancing, if I may quote uh, Oates, because the LGU can afford and absorb the additional expenditure requirements as it move up the uh, the rank or the move move up to a higher uh, local government uh, level. There's also a suggestion in the abstract of the study, but I, I think it's a part of the uh, the presentation to possibly impose an income requirement for uh, barangays. Perhaps uh, this should require uh, uh, another separate study, but we know of efforts and uh, policies that underscore this possible requisite, especially for the cost requirements for the Magna Carta benefits for uh, barangay uh, officials. The cost, uh, well, for us, the cost did not be solely shouldered by uh, barangays, but by higher level LGUs and even the national government considering that the creation of these barangays is towards creating more service delivery units and frontline um, government centers at the community level. Should the income become one of the requirements for the creation of barangays, uh, my suggestion is that the barangay treasurers should be more capacitated, uh, professionalized, and improve the uh, reporting accountabilities, especially on the submission of barangay financial statements uh, as part of our SRE uh, to ensure that we have uh, adequate and granular local finance data on the ground. As for the uh, suggestion that the composition of average income, uh, just a few more, uh, uh, no, one or two more minutes. As for the suggestion that the uh, composition of average income requirements be amended for provinces and municipalities, similar to the income requirement for the conversion to a uh, city that is uh, referring to locally generated income, this should require a more thorough study to cover as many indicators depending on the purpose, since this was only applied to cities through uh, RA9009. So in, in closing, uh, uh, as, as, as we support the recommendations and, uh, and recognize the suggestions in the study, uh, uh, my office, the BLGF, is ready to help and uh, share the wealth of uh, fiscal data that we have and better inform our policymakers, uh, think tanks, uh, CPBRD and uh, PIDs, and uh, researchers working on local governance uh, reform so we can collectively improve the fiscal decentralization and uh, the fiscal governance in our country. And uh, better improve the quality of life of the Filipino people. So thank you very much.
uh, PIDS and to CPBRD. Thank you, Director Paredes, Director Alvina, for your valuable insight. Please join me in giving our presenter and our discussions a well-deserved virtual talk. At this point, we would like to acknowledge our House and Senate officials, friends from the Executive Department, LGUs in the private sector who have joined us in the, room, in the Zoom room and in FB Live. We have with us the Senior Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, um, uh, D.S. Doyle Yachon from Oriental Mindoro. Uh, from the House of Representatives and the Senate, we have Attorney Jose Noel Garong, the Executive Director of Reference and Research Bureau, Director Raul Benabaye, also from RRB, Director Edwin Abenido from the Printing and Reproductive Service, and Director Maria Lisa Pascual from the Internal <laughs> Audit Bureau. From the CEPO, we have with us the Executive Director of CEPO, the, uh, Director uh, Merwin Salazar, and Director Cerces Nifana. From the Executive Department, we have Under Secretary Rolando Toledo of the Department of Budget and Management, Assistant Secretary Greg Pineda of the National Economic and Development Authority, Director Pamela Kizon of uh, BLGF, and Director Paul Ryan Yu of the Philippine Air Force. From the local government units, we have Vice Mayor Sebastian Huache of Unisan Quezon. From the private sector, we have Mr. Jonathan David Flavier, the Chairman of Cooperative Movement for Encouraging NSV. Former BIR Commissioner Joel Tan Torres, now Dean of the UP School of Business. Uh, Maria Erika Quilios, a Council Member of NAPSI CBS. DOF Assistant Secretary Maria Teresa Habitan, now Chancellor of the Philippine Tax Academy and former <laughs> Dean of the UPNC PAG. Uh, Dean Alex Brillantes. An event in the Philippines will not be complete unless we take a souvenir photograph. May I ask all participants to please open your videos so our technical staff can capture your beautiful smiles. Let us wait for the others to open their video videos. <laughs> Okay, hold that in five, four, three, two, and one. Thank you. To moderate the open forum, may I introduce my colleague who is an LGU finance specialist herself. I am referring to Ms. Pamela Diaz Manalo, the Director of the Budget Policy and Research Service of CPPID. Um, Yeah, thank you, D.D. Dina uh, Pasagi. I will not attempt to summarize the presentation of Dr. Justine, but after hearing the uh, presentation from Dr. Sikat and also from our discussants, uh, Executive Director uh, Sandra Paredes of the League of Provinces and uh, Executive Director Nino Alvina of the BLGF uh, at the Department of Finance. Now we have the opportunity to engage them in uh, the open forum. You might have some points that you want to clarify. In fact, we have uh, a lot of questions already in the chat box here in our uh, Zoom meeting. Um, I am um, trying to organize how I would uh, sequence the questions. But um, allow me first to um, maybe start with uh, questions pertaining to uh, methodology, you know, methodology of the, of the study. Uh, there's a question here from um, um, E.D. Bangsal. In determining the fiscal viability of LGUs, other than the traditional variables, which is population, land area, and the lo local income, have you considered also looking at other variables reflecting socioeconomic structure of the LGU, such as infrastructure, capacity, human development index, and the like? That is addressed to Dr. Justine. 
sikat. Oh, um, before that, um, my apology. Um, joining us also in the open forum is Dr. Vicente Vic Paqueo, who is the co-author of Dr. Sikat. My apologies, Sir Vic. Doc, um, Dr. Paqueo is uh, a distinguished visiting research fellow at the PIDS. And as I said, the co-author of Dr. Sikat of uh, this particular study that we are discussing now. So welcome, welcome, Dr. Paqueo. Uh, Dr. Justine? Yes, thank you, Director Pham. Thank you for that question, Edi Bangsal. Well, what we did look like look at um, the other variables were more of the social political variables that we were able to gather during our primary data collection. We asked about the extent of years in office of the incumbent mayor, whether he was part of a political dynasty. We also asked, um, we also looked at the other indicators that we found there with regards to our focus there was development planning and updating of development plans of municipalities and investment programs. That was our primary priority. So those were the ones that we, we looked at. In short, we didn't yet consider the, the cases of HDI or infra or capacity building. I think, you know, we had the bigger plan for this particular study, but then one of the challenges was it. we were going through a transition. We were waiting for the devolution transition plans to be completed. Um, in preparation for this. So we had to figure out how to, I think at least first establish that there's a need. I, I'm, you know, the policymakers here present, like in the case of ED uh, Avinia and, and the CPBRD, I know they have really been pushing for these reforms with respect to LGU income. So, so we were trying to find a way to be able to, you know, just get this on the table first. Uh, so thank you. Um, this, there is also a, a question here, um, particularly on the study, asking if um, uh, in your uh, in your regression, yeah, the regression, where you uh, where you you presented actually graphs on uh, municipal on um, provinces, cities, and municipalities. Um, a participant is asking whether the highly urbanized cities, independent cities, and the component cities were just lumped together. And actually, this is also a comment, maybe a good, it may be good also to distinguish since these uh, HUCs and independent cities have different supervision requirements than the component cities. Okay, thank you for that comment. Actually, it is for the stylized facts that we use the, the component cities and you're right, it was lumped together. But for the regression analysis, this was only based on our unique cross-sectional uh, data on municipalities. So 1,373, actually it was 1,338, I believe. That was the final observation number mm -hmm. of the municipalities that we looked uh, at in terms of the regression analysis. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I see two hands uh, raised in our Zoom meeting. I'd like to acknowledge the real a local government expert, uh, Dr. Alex Brillantes. Welcome, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we give you the floor for your question, sir, oh, or more you. insights. I'm humbled. I'm humbled by what you just said, but we're all students here, and I'm really humbled. But anyway, well, I really would like to congratulate you for this great study. You know, uh, we've been talking about the need for amalgamation for some time. And if uh, really congratulations, Dr. Sikat and Dr. Pakeo, and of course, to PIDS and uh, Dr. Miran. Because a few years ago, um, Dr. Jokno, your dad, Secretary Ben, asked us to do a right-sizing study of the bureaucracy. A number of us, no? And I was assigned to local government and uh, education. And our team actually had several findings. And one major finding was really the importance of seriously considering amalgamation. Unfortunately, the study still with DBM, naka-embargo pa ata. But ang, ang point ko doon, we talk about amalgamation. We talk about the need for it. Uh, we look at the, uh, the Japan experience. The bottom line there is, it's really about time to look at this. And I know Dr. Miral in his uh, uh, open discussion talk about the uh, numerous LGUs. But we, we talked about that. And we have experiences. Nabagit ang Sorsogon Bagon, nabagit ang Igakos, etc. But equally important, no, uh, some time back, and uh, even DILG under Secretary Dino has actually initiated sa barangay level amalgamation. I'm very happy that this is really part now of this mainstream discourse because you and I know that this is really counterintuitive. Eh? 
Uh, you and I know about fragmentation. You and I know about uh, gerrymandering, no? uh, the political thing. So I think it's really great that PIDS and CPBRD are moving in this direction. Perhaps the next major step, I, know, I don't know, uh, Justin, uh, taking off from this great study, you know, we, we could have a, a multi-disciplinary uh, study that will look at the different aspects of amalgamation, political viability, administrative viability, and of course, taking off from the evidence that you guys have mentioned. I, I remember mentioning this to Dr. Lianto a long time ago when he was president of PIDS, and congratulations, by the way, uh, um, uh, uh, on your appointment, uh, uh, Dr. Arbeta, no? But we've talked about this before already. So it's really great that we're really pushing the envelope. And ngayon na nagkaroon tayo nitong quote-unquote Mandanas Garcia, this, the, decision, uh, the, the decision, This it's really a great time to be discussing this. But maybe as a part of our research agenda, I mean, babes, and uh, of course, June, we might look at this, you know, a massive study, because at one point, I'll shut up of this. At one point, this was, in, this, was in, this was done in Japan during the Meiji Restoration. Massive amalgamation. And guess where they are today? No? So maybe we could look at that. Eh? But indeed, uh, the, uh, Justin, your figures are excellent. Dr. Pakay, your figures are great. And we could really uh, use that, uh, take off from your study. Congratulations. So my point, uh, Justin, my question is, barangay level. Maybe we could begin with that. Ginagawa niya sa, sa, sa Baguio, 125 barangays, you know, they can be about uh, 25. Or Mok City with, uh, with mayor, uh, or mayor there, from 25 barangays, spreading, spreading tatlo. So ang, ang point dito is, you know, if you start with that and then move up, even as we move up, there'll be more political opposition. But hey, uh, discourse, mindset of amalgamation towards our collective goal of good governance. Now I talk too much. Maraming salamat. And congratulations. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Berliantes. I think the last time I saw you was just before we shut down for the pandemic, that was March of 2020. Yeah. We were with the DevCom, or we were in LGA. I remember that was the last time that we, we saw each other. So thank you so much for your support. And of course, you would know better about with your experience about the challenges in making this amalgamation happen. And I'm happy to hear about your right sizing. Actually, I keep talking to, I mentioned this to Dr. Jun before. I have a discussion paper also on right sizing, but this is at the national government level because I feel strongly about this as well, streamlining really um, the functions across the national government. But then uh, I know it was also shelved first for the meantime, it wasn't yet um, priority uh, legislature. But yeah, let's see. I. That would require more study, though, especially at the barangay level. But thank you for giving me the examples that it's being it's being done now in in some provinces. So, so thank you so much for that. It needs further study for sure. Down to the barangay level. Eventually, will you do that? Perhaps. Um, it depends on the quality of data we can get from BLGF. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I passed this on to EDL, Oh, yeah. And congratulations also, Nino. Kasi meron ng move within the ILG, eh. And uh, through you, Sagdino, you know. And maybe we could, uh, there are already some stakeholders look at this. So it's really grabbing the opportunity just to mainstream the discourse of uh, changing our mindsets that, hey, amalgamation, uh, interlocal cooperation, you know, uh, Nino himself is an expert on this. So thank you very much again. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Uh, brilliantes. Oh, yes, uh, Dr. Vic. Yes. Uh, I'd just like to um, share my um, reflections. This is related to the comment of Dr. Berlant, um about amalgamation, rationalization. Uh, and I, I agree with, with him. Um, and Justin uh, and, and I were. Uh, 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 Dr. Vick, I told her that I think um, we need to, uh, in terms, yes, hello, Do Dr. Pakeo, yes, uh, uh, yes, you're coming, yeah, you're coming in, Chapi. Um, not very clear, Paul. Oh. Um, um, maybe it, you can uh, put off your video so it can okay. it can help with the audibility of your of the sound. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, better, better, sir. Okay. So, um, yeah. I mean, definitely, um, uh, Justin and I would would agree on, on the need to. 
uh, dig deeper on uh, issues, including uh, what um, uh, Dr. Brillantis uh, mentioned about the um, amalgamation. Dr. Vick, Dr. Paqueo, we cannot hear you. Dr. Paqueo? Dr. Paqueo? No, it's un unfortunate that we cannot uh, uh, get a good audio of Dr. Paqueo. Dr. Pakeo? Sir, uh, we cannot hear you clearly. Um, maybe if you can type in some of the, the key points that you were trying to, to share and maybe later we can get a better audio. Let me just proceed to the next uh, uh, question. Uh, question. Uh, now that uh, Dr. Brillantes actually mentioned about uh, amalgamation, there's a question here uh, by Joseph Solis. It's addressed to our, to our presenter, no? Dr. Sikat, and also to um, uh, E.D. Uh, Sandra Paredes. Do you think it's politically feasible to undergo nationwide amalgamation of non-performing small LGUs into bigger performing LGUs, given that some LGUs exist out of political expediency. Um, thank you uh, for the challenging question. I will defer to E.D. Sandy Paredes. I think she has more experience on the um, political front. Uh, yes. Uh, Edie Sandy, <laughs> passing the bank will don't it won't do you any good. <laughs> <laughs> just the same, just the same. Okay, the question is, it's really political will, you know, because the ones to decide amalgamation would be either Congress or the local, the local Sanguinian. and and it ultimately should be approved by the people to apply the seat. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking of even people's initiative, Justin. Maybe people, through people's initiative, if they really see that their LG is non-performing, the, the people's initiative, you know, the, the decision in the Santiago case, uh, whether the, the law on people's initiative is sufficient, the Supreme Court actually came out already with a resolution saying that the law is sufficient uh, as basis for people's initiative, be it uh, from the local uh, local law, uh, ordinances or uh, legislation in Congress, pwede na yung people's initiative. In fact, nagpi-people's initiative na nga kami on the uh, amendment of the Constitution, Section 6, Article 10, to make from our share for, from 40% to 50%. Because if we don't see any signs sa Congress na itataas yan from 40 to 50, we're also doing our own move. We're, we're, we're relying on people's initiative already. So yung amalgamation, wala pang nangyari yan today. In fact, sabi ko nga, there are uh, so many provinces, 21 province, ilan ba yun? Sinabi ko, 21 provinces na hindi nga compliant pa sa, 20 provinces hindi nga compliant sa land area. 13 provinces, yung isa-isa ko population census, 2020 census, yung ginamit ko, pa rin, not, not uh, compliant with the benchmark. 
But you know, these these producers, they vested rights not because only eight uh, are new provinces after the passage of the local government code. So vested right na yan. Uh, but you know, anything's possible. If it's a political will, I don't see any any reason why it cannot happen, Justin. But uh, really, it's it, kasi yung the way our, the constitution has structured the the delineation of powers, uh, it really falls on the shoulder of the, the, the Congress. So, depende sa political will. Pero kung hindi nga, yun like, what I said, kung hindi nagpa-perform yung ano, ang tingin ko, what Alex Brillante suggested, hi Alex, uh, ano, is uh, doable. Because we can start with the barangay, see, and, and uh, we have to take the advantage of the opportunity that no less than the USEC of the ILG is at the forefront of this move. And uh, let's take the cue from there. Tignan natin yung, kasi there has to be, there has to be, uh, it has to be incentivized. And also, there has to be clear uh, output. Like, pag-aralan ba? Ano ba nangyari sa Island Garden City of Samal? Nag-improve ba yung kanilang delivery of basic services when they amalgamated? I mean, it, it, we have to show proof. It, the proof of concept must be, must be present so that we can convince but uh, let's not do it before election. Well, definitely, it's not gonna happen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Edie, for, for that. And I was thinking also, yeah, because I know you have more experience with respect to this. But but I was also thinking, because the other options are, um, like I heard, I was at the DAP forum last week. I was also presenting there. It was shared by some of the local um, chief executives that they really take advantage of interlocal cooperation um, with respect to some of the different goods and services. And it was also highlighted like by also by E.D. Nino earlier that that higher levels of you know local governments let's say could strengthen or fortify their oversight function. Let's say I have we have another discussion paper that looked at the um, link between planning and budgeting across the different levels of government, parang linking the PDP all the way down to the municipality. And this is actually, um, you know, what came out of that is that RDC to, to the provinces is pretty strong, the oversight there, but perhaps we could strengthen further, you know, cooperation or, you know, common provision of certain goods and services that cross boundaries within a province or something like that. If if I, you know, I don't know how, what political traction this kind of reforms would take. So thank you so much. Actually, if I may add, there are actually 200, 113 provinces na bago, na walang ira. It, it was created by the LGU. So, mm -hmm. wow. na lalo. Uh, that's my last count. Um, and uh, like you're right, the inter-LGU collaboration can be... Uh, resorted to, like uh, Metro Davao or Metro Bataan, mga ganyan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I saw one chat question of Dr. Miral, why daw that uh, this amalgamation is not happening? Uh, mm -hmm. I think also, uh, you know, I mean, he was in the chat box, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Miral, you said uh, the inter-LGU collaboration pala. Mm -hmm. but on that matter, uh, there are some LGUs that wanted to collaborate uh, to to um, yung consolidate their resources. The problem was, sino nga hawak ng pera? Are we going to create a new structure or uh, will, will we designate one LG to, to manage the funds? May mga ganong aspect. So if we can, if we can uh, look for a more efficient way to manage inter-LGU collaboration, which is already allowed in the local government code and in the constitution, no less. Pwede yung inter-LGU inter collaboration. In fact, yung sinasabi mo, Justin, na 76% of ang utilization lang ng 20% development fund, you know, iniisip namin yan, eh, pinag-aaralan din namin yung, yung reasons. For one thing, um, you know, the end cash balance of an LGU in their statement of issues and expenditures um, it is the beginning balance for the next, for the succeeding year. So, mamaya, madelay yung release ng NTA, no? So, meron silang pansweldo. It may buffer. Uh, and, and, you know, pag-infrastructure, 
hindi naman lahat talaga 20% ang pangangailangan nila for infrastructure. Pinipilit natin kasing 20%. Diyan kami na ano, yung yung uh, mandatory, yung mga statutory obligations ng LGU. Huwag na kasing nilalagyan ng 5% for this one, 20%. Na, na sa sayang eh, yung utilization. Kasi kanya-kanyang priorities talaga, we should respect the the priorities of each LGU. Uh, it could be that ano, yung 76% is the aggregate figure. You should disaggregate it, di ba? Uh, because the, the excesses in surplus or cash excess, yung excesses dyan, uh, but I think, if, na, if I'm not mistaken, 44% nasa highly urbanized cities na yan eh, tsaka NCR. The rest of the LGUs, hindi ganun kalaki ang savings. It's just enough to to, to pay, turn the tide for the for the succeeding year. Tsaka yung yung expenditure, syempre meron pa yung kailangan itatabing trust funds for the disaster. Kailang, magagamit mo lang siya pagka merong declaration of calamity. So naka-reserve siya, na part siya ng savings. Or, so but it, it's not really savings kasi may multi-year obligations pa yan. May mga pending prior year obligations. So a lot of factors. We cannot uh, come up with a uh, presumption na, o oh, hindi nyo naman ni-spend yung money nyo, why do you deserve additional revenue? So, it's not, it's not really accurate to, to really say that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Didi Sandy. Uh, before I acknowledge uh, Mr. Anthony uh, Cadiz uh, for his question, let me uh, pose these questions to uh, Idi Nino Alvina. Um, can the executive implement a moratorium on the creation of new provinces as this goes against improvements in the delivery of basic services if implemented at large scale. And maybe another question, since it, uh, Samal, no? Samal was uh, mentioned earlier, and there's a question here also uh, that specifically mentions uh, the island garden city of Samal. What can you say about the present and future fiscal viability of the city? Well, um, on uh, Samal, um, I would rather uh, discuss it uh, with, directly with, with the LG. You know? That's why I, I mentioned uh, earlier, it's a good uh, a case study uh, that uh, we can look at pre-amalgamation uh, and where uh, it is now. Uh, on the second question on a moratorium, uh, maybe uh, Idi Sandy could better answer it, but as far as I'm concerned, it originates with Congress. No? Uh, so the, 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 the motivation should also uh, come from uh, the LG. What is really the, 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 the purpose? Um, if I may just take this opportunity to quickly comment on the uh, uh, inputs of uh, Dean Alex. Uh, Sir Alex, thank you for uh, those uh, insights, uh, especially on uh, Barangay. Uh, we're working closely with uh, DILG because we really want to capture the local finance data of uh, barangays. We've had uh, earlier efforts in 2017, 2018. Uh, we have the tool already. Uh, it's, it's available. We're asking the uh, support of a DILG to make it mandatory for uh, barangays to really accomplish uh, in a timely manner and accurately this uh, financial statement so that we can have uh, evidence for uh, what you are suggesting to look at the uh, amalgamation at the barangay uh, level. We note that we have around 30 or 35% compliance on the uh, reporting. Uh, that is also an issue on uh, the, the, the personnel available to do all these uh, reports. But again, we must emphasize that uh, the accountability should be strengthened now that uh, NTA is also there. Uh, the, 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 the fiscal transparency and reporting should likewise uh, uh, be improved. So those are just my, uh, my uh, inputs. And on, on the issue on uh, amalgamation as a general strategy, I think uh, we, we, we should also consider uh, transition, right? Because it might lead to a lot of disruption uh, in governance uh, services. So just like converting to newly created uh, or converting to uh, cities, Again, they have internal transitions from the province when they wind out to become uh, independent or when they, when they become component city because of the uh, taxing powers and expenditure responsibilities that are unique now to that level of uh, government. Thank you. 
can I take on that uh, ano, that portion? Sige, since sinalons mo. Yeah. <laughs> Sige, ma'am. Yeah, quick lang. Uh, then we will give the floor to Mr. Anthony Cadiz. Yes, ma'am. On moratorium. You know, when when Palawan was uh, proposed to be book to be, I don't know, created into three, uh, during General Assemblies of the Deeds, uh, may self-imposed moratorium kami. Nag-usap-uusap din na wag na munang mag-create ng new, ganyan, o mag-divide ng new. But, you know, uh, because Congress also gets our endorsement, whether the League endorses the creation of a new province, ganyan. So we, we, we take a stand, we take a firm stand. In the case of, the, of Palawan, Siyempre, um, nakita namin din yung, yung need kasi ang, la ang laki-laki talaga ng Palawan. Before makarating si Governor Alvarez sa, sa, sa dulo, it takes two or three days. So, so the, the management, the cost of you know, monitoring, supervising, hirap, hirap din siya. Kasi borders yung kanya eh, yung kailangan tutukan. So that's why we, 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 ano, we recommended that. But, uh, Ultimate, like I said, ano, plebiscito. So, depende sa tao. Uh, the DOF, I don't think they can really impose a moratorium because it's really prerogative of Congress. We're only recommendatory. It's really Congress. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I acknowledge Mr. Anthony Cadiz. You are raising your hand. Mr. Anthony? Yes, ma'am. Yes, your question. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Yes, yes. You have the floor now, Anthony. Anthony, do you have a question to any of our resource persons? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, I, I, sorry, sorry. Maybe uh, type in the question. Yeah. Okay, Anthony. May I uh, if you're having uh, technical problems, may I suggest that you type in your question at the chat box? Okay. May I acknowledge uh, Miss Marilyn? Okay, ma'am. My connection is stable. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. May I acknowledge uh, Ms. Marilyn Manait for her question? Uh, hi. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the, this uh, webinar. No? Um, I'm, I'm actually interested about the amalgamation of uh, local government units because as of now, um, there are already ongoing, it's not really amalgamation in, this, in that sense, but uh, inter-LGU cooperation especially in so far as uh, relocation of uh, informal settler families are concerned. Like um, Quezon City, for example, would um, coordinate with, say, uh, San Jose del Monte and Bulacan so that uh, some of its uh, residents can be resettled in um, San Jose, Bulacan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, ako kasi I'm, I'm, I'm also more interested in we should also do that because I think it, it will solve the, the economies of scale for one and that it will maximize resources of, of all the LGUs, no? Tapos, uh, yung isang gusto ko makita yung waste management because waste management uh, encompasses, is not limited within like Quezon City, for example, mm -hmm. or in Bulacan, Lab, for example, or, or in San Juan, for example. So I would like to see a, a, a strong coordination among LGUs so that the issue of waste management is actually addressed, uh, mm -hmm. maximizing resources, etc. Yung isa pang um, um, tingin ko pwedeng gawin yan is, so housing, um, asan ba yun? Waste management, saka disaster preparedness. Kasi, di ba, when a disaster hits, it's not only like, uh, in the case of Tacloban, it was not only Tacloban what we, who, what, which was hit by, by Yolanda, especially because Yolanda was a massive typhoon. Um, na, na, in a, pati Metro Manila. So, ang tanong ko basically ganito, um, pag natuloy yung amalgamation, how would resources be shared or uh, spent for, for the activities that is um, going to be conducted in amalgamation? Tapos, how will amalgamation be process, processed? Would it be geographical? Yung magkakatabibang LGUs? 
or would it be based on the income level of each LGUs? In which case, um, kung geographical yan, uh, kanino kunyari ikakabit ang Batanes? Or ay provincial na yan, kung, kung, kung hindi, siguro madali nang sagutin yung kung geographical. Kung income level naman, uh, yung mahirap bang barangay sa dulo ng kunyari, uh, kunyari ng Rizal, i-amalgamate ba yun sa sa mahirap na, na na barangay sa dulong south naman ng Rizal. So in that case, uh, how would amalgamation work in that sense kung magkakalayo pero pareho silang income level? Tapos uh, follow up to that ano, yung kung income level ang pagbabase ng amalgamation, there will be little fans that will go around among these barangays na pare-parehong mahihirap. In that case, magiging highly dependent pa rin sila for external funding, external support from uh, from higher or bigger LGUs. So, yun lang po. Okay. Uh, thank okay. you, uh, Dr. Justine. And maybe, um, maybe Sandy uh, would like to uh, say something about this also. Yeah, and the I'm also going to throw... I'm gonna throw something. Thank you for that question, uh, Ms. Manayit. I'm also gonna throw something to to Edie Nino as well um, with regard to something that Sandy, uh, Edie Sandy raised earlier. Um, thank you for that. That's very important. Uh, this requires actually more study. And first of all, it would depend on the political will. The stories that I've heard of inter-LGU cooperation would actually be those contiguous to each other um, or because it makes more sense. Uh, if it's waste, water, then of course it would be wastewater. Like in the case of the MMDA uh, was mentioned earlier by E.D. Sandy, we created another level of governance that deals with, you know, flood control and and such that, that would overlap. So I would imagine first, of course this needs to be studied further, no? Would be contiguous. Um, there was an example, I think it was in Tobacco City that I heard from Mayor uh, Luistro, that they do inter LGU cooperation, but I still have yet further to exp explore uh, or understand how they do it in sh in terms of sharing funds. If there is no such level of governance across that, so but I know that the inter LGU cooperation is allowed for. So perhaps you know those with more practical experience, such as Edi Sandy or Edi Nino, would be able to say how this could be done, um, in, especially in terms of pitching in uh, for. Uh, because irrigation also might might also cross borders, the same as water districts of water supply, like I mentioned earlier. So, so how could this be done, you know, in practice? Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to raise a related question here by um, Executive Director Merwin Salazar from CEPO. Uh, he's asking for examples, actually, of inter-LGU arrangements um, that have been forged to, del to deliver public services across LGUs and how effective were they in increasing welfare gains or how efficient were these arrangements in terms of saving costs in the delivery of public services? Do we have some examples? So maybe uh, from the League of Provinces, if mom can easily think of something for, <laughs> for an example of inter-LGU uh, arrangements so or even in you. On the land, on the weather... Uh, for amalgamation to happen, it must be contiguous, okay? Because the law provides, the local government code under uh, section 7, yung land area kasi, before, ang, ang share kasi ng LGU nata, depende sa land area na sinasertify ng land management bureau. So for a uh, LGU, for one LGU, the land area certification, it must be contiguous. But uh, the, the contiguity is not required for inter-LGU collaboration. This is a difference, okay? For inter-LGU collaboration, marami, parang sisterhood lang yan eh. Sister cities. In fact, um, uh, marami ng, um, like Makati has adopted so many LGUs, tinutulungan ng Makati. Kasi yung sasabi ko nga, na surplus funds ng NCR. Dahil sa laki ng, like, Makati, 5% lang ng, ng income nila ang IRE eh, o ang NPA. So they have a lot of excess funds which they can tie up or sit, partner with another LG, not necessarily contiguous. Now on the management of funds, nasa, it's like kasi LGs are ano, corporate entities. 
So they can sue, they can be sued, they can partner, they can enter into a MOA, they can enter into a joint venture, economic enterprise. Pwede yun. So for delivery of like, well, Metro Manila Development Authority, as far as basic services, you spill over. Yan, yan ang purpose ng MMBA, collaboration. Pero uh, yun na nga eh, kina-question lang namin yung it is not it is not entitled to receive an automatic share of ira what the charter of mmda was referring to that the mmda shall continue to receive what has been received by the defunct mmc that is the share of the mmc from the five from the five percent of the gross revenues of the metro manila lgus now in case they default in payment the DBM, DBM is authorized by law to deduct from the ERA of that defaulting LGU. So, yung ERA, sa LGU pa rin, it's not the ERA of MNC. Pa, paano siya continue to receive? 1991 ang code, 1995 nila inumpisahan ng MMDA bigyan ng, ng uh, ERA. That's it is illegal. That's unconstitutional because the Section 6, Article 10, sa Mandanas ruling, sinabi na ng kote, LGUs. Pag hindi LGU, shall have a just share in the national taxes. Pag hindi LGU, pag nang LGU, it's not, they're not entitled to an automatic share. Claro yun. It's just the statutory construction that is uh, erroneous. Kasi they can, they can, uh, they can, May, may precedent na eh. It's, it's, it's just as an administrative matter. And on the, yung sa income ng barangay, Justin, may ginawa akong study dyan before. Uh, 65% of our barangays received about 1 to 2 million ira before. So, ganun yung kanilang income capacity. 1 to 2 million majority of the barangays. So, for them to amalgamate, uh, again, bago mag-eleksyon kasi ang hirap mag ano eh, pag nakaupo na, nasasarapan na eh. <laughs> That's the problem. Hindi ko masagot yung actual examples. Yeah, well, I keep on reading. Um, yes, um, um, I think we have in the Zoom meeting, um, Director Ana Bunagua from the DILG. Director Ana, if you would wish to pitch in for some examples, uh, you are most welcome. Good afternoon, Director Anna. Hi to you, Sakroli. Yeah, sorry for putting you on the spot, but you're welcome uh, to, you know, raise hand and if you would like to share something in our forum. But uh, so let me, um, oh, okay. Thank you, Director Anna. Maybe you're most familiar with uh, in inter lgu arrangement so maybe you can give us uh, an example of one that is working um well marami salamat no i'm not part of the but i'll pitch in uh well uh inter the dilg have uh done several advocacy on interlocal government operations uh, uh way before in the past and we have several um ALZU collaborative activities that have been put together. Pero uh, most of them did not last since changes in administration in leadership in local government is one factor in sustaining amalgamation. But there are several uh, sustaining LZU collaboration. But there are several uh, uh, partnerships and LZU collaboration that have uh, sustained because of uh, uh, they have um, um, ano, uh, parang mechanism in order to sustain like, like an executive order for Metro Naga Development Council and also for MIGETC, that Metro Iloilo Gimaras Economic Development Council. But for those um, uh, interlocal cooperation which were uh, made viable by a memorandum of agreement among local government units when there are changes in leadership, uh, most of the time the collaboration also dies because of uh, the new leadership. And there are no... Aside from the memorandum of agreement, there have, there, they, they have no binding um, agreement. For example, sharing resources. Uh, yun yung sinasabi ni, ni, ni Sandy that uh, they will still share their era, pero kanya-kanya pa rin yung resources yun from different LCU. There is no uh, 
they will have or they, they have the authority to actually unite their resources in one entity as the uh, in order to implement programs. So they will still be using shared resources coming from the uh, resources of each of the LCU, and they will each LCU will still be accountable for each of their resources. So I think th those are the factors for which uh, uh, made collaboration not sustainable in many of the uh, collaborative arrangement where the uh, is involved in this. So yon, um, we are still monitoring some of the alliances. Some of them are sustained and many are project-based. For example, right now, very active yung uh, sa uh, Benguet Apayao uh, with other six other municipalities regarding inter-local health zones. So mostly driven by programs or united or unified um, programs for the adjacent municipalities or centers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Anya. Yes, um, maybe a, a question uh, directed to uh, Idi Alvina. Uh, can fiscal viability be one of the metrics in the awarding of the S? LGG, or this is also for the ILG now, for, our, for the uh, seal of local, a good local governance. Can, fiscal, yeah, um, can viability be a metric? Well, we don't term it as uh, fiscal viability, but uh, we have several indicators in, uh, uh, in, in, in SGLG to determine uh, the, the fiscal position of uh, the LGs. If I can recall, if we have around uh, maybe six or seven uh, uh, indicators, uh, which includes uh, the utilization of local development fund, uh, the audit opinion coming from COA, um, the, the full disclosure or the transparency initiatives. Uh, on the part of BLGF, we monitor their uh, local revenue growth and uh, the utilization of uh, their uh, ERA, uh, especially the local development fund. So, uh, as well as their reporting to, uh, to us on their uh, receipts and uh, income. So those are the things that we send to uh, uh, the DILG. But I understand DILG also does the monitoring of uh, the different projects that are uh, implemented, uh, especially under the PCF. Um, uh, th there's uh, another one. And uh, they look at the budget uh, of the LG, whether they have an approved budget for the current year. So those are the indicators uh, being used for uh, SGLG as far as fiscal uh, dimension uh, is concerned. So not necessarily uh, the, the, the criteria that we have discussed on uh, fiscal viability uh, uh, earlier. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from... Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Avila, Tony Avila, uh, one important variable to determine the fiscal viability is taxable capacity. Yeah. So have this is a question maybe to Dr. Justine. Have you considered this variable, taxable capacity? Uh, please note that for LGUs to be viable, they should be able to generate their own source revenues. And may I just uh, also raise uh, this is a personal question. Do, would you suggest uh, fiscal capacity as a criterion for ERA? Okay, so thank you for those questions. Actually, I just replied to uh, to Tony's. Hi, Tony. Thanks for always being around. So thank you for your comments. Yeah, um, the taxable capacity, well, as I mentioned earlier, the study really was supposed to, we were supposed to pattern it after another study that was done in the US. And we were trying to come out with summary um, information on the total value of real properties per municipality. But we found that a bit of a challenge um, that was, that would have ideally been, you know, the taxable capacity, let's say in terms of sustainable real property tax revenues and, and such. So, so we had to resort to, uh, you know, we had to adopt, uh, change our methodology just for this year's study because at PIDS, we have to complete our studies within a year. Uh, so, so we had to, to, to change this. Otherwise, our utilization rate will be low. Uh, so we had to change our, our structure uh, of this particular study. And um, what the taxable capacity that we included were really just indicators of income of the LGUs current operating income, uh, we also included some poverty incidents. 
uh, we looked at the different variables and explored with those different socioeconomic variables. And, and the DP would have a, a more of a discussion on that. Now, on your question, Director Pam, no? Parang, are there any other, uh, what is this, uh, fiscal variables that, that could be considered, perhaps? Oh, would, you your question? would you suggest yeah. uh, fiscal capacity as a criterion for uh, ERA? Um, actually, so uh, first would be how to define that fiscal capacity, but but whichever, I, I, as I recall no, from my studies on the history of decentralization in the Philippines, originally, the era was supposed to be just about 20% of revenue collection in its initial phase, no, the, the one originally proposed, I think, by the Pino you know, administration, just 20% of revenues plus 5% based on development uh, indicators. Um, I think the, the, the initial intention from my readings of history is that it was supposed to be based on capacity. So to, to help or some kind of development indicators, perhaps to incentivize improved performance uh, on the case of some poorer municipalities who were able to improve performance. But it never went into fruition. It became 40% of internal revenues without any, um, you know, um, consideration of fiscal capacities. Uh, only only consideration would be population and land area, thinking that if you have more population, you have to, you need more money to serve, uh, and same for a broader area. So I think the results showed that there are other indicators that were significant. Um, the, the governance indicators, which I was referring to, that might suggest, you know, this moving forward, these could be considered either, let's say, in the, you know, feasibility or perhaps in the distribution of the NATA in the future. So thank you for that question. Yeah. But again, the problems would be um, political will again. And, and I'd like to say that these major reforms that say should actually be done once, you know, once a new administration is in office, it's the perfect time to institute new reforms. So, so that's. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Justine. Um, Dr. Miral has a question here actually pertaining to uh, the creation of, of barangays. Uh, and um, any of the resource persons can can, uh, can respond to this. Uh, do you think that uh, transforming barangays from autonomous political units into administrative units of municipalities and cities would lead to increased efficiency and effectiveness of local service delivery? Uh, as it is sa ngayon, nag-volunteer na ako kasi hindi ni-make ni si Justin siya si Nina. <laughs> uh, sa ngayon, parang ang administratives, kasi barangay officials are not even getting, sa they're not salaried uh, public officials. Eh. They're only getting allowance and honorarium. Eh. Parang ang administrative unit sila, but there are functioning you know, they're functioning as, as it is already. What would be the difference between a politically... Because we can't do that. We have to change the constitution. The constitution itself says there are four... In, in subsidiarity principle, province, city, municipality, barangay. Mahirap mag-change pag nasa constitution. So we have to face realities. In fact, our position nga is if we only... If LGs are only given the right share, no, the just share. Kaya naman swelduhan talaga ang barangay. Kita naman natin kawawang-kawawa sila ngayon COVID, di ba? Sa kanila baksak lahat ng mga uh, responsibilities and, and and the danger that they face, no? Uh, it's really not commensurate to the meager allowance that they get. So, actually, we have asked, we are asking the presidential and senatorial candidates, what is your take on the on that, yung salary ng barangay, yung alawa sa maging salary, and also yung, yung stand nila sa Supreme Court uh, decision implementation. Kasi it, it impacts on the fiscal viability na of LGUs. So administrative or political doesn't really matter what they're called. You know, a rose is still a rose by any other name. Uh, their functioning, their function will not be, will not alter. They will, they are the frontliners ultimately. So, I don't think that would be a problem. Yung, yung, yun lang, yung, ano ba yung isang question kanina, Justin, yung sa, 
<laughs> sa dami kasi nagpatong papin yung question. I wanted to comment earlier on what you were you were saying kanina. Like senior moment lang ako. What were you saying? Then, <laughs> I forget. I'm reading the chat and dami pang questions so I tried to answer also. Yes, and I, I'm actually trying to uh, consolidate the, the, the questions, no? Baka yung bata-bata si E.D. A question earlier was on uh, uh, fiscal capacity as a criterion for the era, or... Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. uh, for me, uh, I've been advocating for 30 years on that era, MPA. Mukha, Miss Ira na nga tawag nila sa akin. Anyway... Yang ano, I think the uh, the other indicators, Justin, yung sa poverty incidents, diba? yung mga uh, per capita, SGLG, uh, those factors, I think it's really very difficult to change the formula now. You know, inabot na 30 years. Inupuan, wala. Ang dami ng studies ang ginawa. JICA, kung ano-ano studies ang walang nangyari. So reality is, let's face it, ganyan. Nahirap kasi to get a consensus. Depends on political will. But if we create, uh, like what, when we went to Australia, there's a grants commission that has that uh, administers the equalization fund. No, there's an equalization fund. Uh, doon natin i-factor in lahat yung mga bright ideas on how to uh, augment the income of deserving LGUs that are really, you know, uh, they have the capacity to really serve and 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 the and, the, and, and all the because may marami first and second class LGU ang grabe ang poverty incidence nila, diba? So it it's not uh, the, uh, it's not automatic na first class ka na LGU ang poverty incidence mo mababa. Baliktad nga eh, diba? Counterintuitive na yung income classification na nangyayari. So Right now, yung 208 level, sinasabi na nga namin, 99% ng provinces, just in first class na nga, eh, yun sa 2008 level. So how can it be made now a basis of financial assistance under the EO138 on full devolution? They will only limit the financial assistance to LGU to the fourth and sixth class using that income classification of 2008, which is so mind-boggling because 99% na, imagine mo at 450 million benchmark for first class. Look at Davao, uh, diba? Davao na, Occidental na lang 171 million ng income. The rest, billions na nga eh, 8 billion, diba? Pero when you showed your graphs, Justin, on the, like yung sa health, yung mga indicators mo, kung titignan mo, when I showed the, the slide of Bangsal on the NCR getting most of the rev local revenues, diba? it doesn't automatically translate to better services. Not even, because in your slides, you showed that uh, they're even falling short of the of the expected uh, delivery ng services. Tignan mo region 4A, uh, region 3, and NCR. Tignan mo yung kanilang uh, level of accomplishment in those, in those uh, areas. It's, it's comparatively the same with all the other regions, despite the fact that they really earn a lot more. Um, lalo na ngayon, merong COVID. So, uh, yung payment online. So, how do we now uh, how do we now ensure that, kasi yung under the cycles of taxation, 30% goes to the uh, LGU where the headquarters of that business is. 70%. Happy, happy pa yan sa mga branches. But we don't know where the branches are. In their reporting, they only uh, remit aggregate income. Wala nang breakdown. So, yung 70% na nakatenga nga dyan sa ninyo, di ba? May pound ba pa kami dyan? Hindi nga na nga nire-release eh. Kasi... Hindi nga malama kung saan i-release yung 70% yung distribution mode. They, they, cannot, they can't distribute and the money is there. So, yun. Sorry. I... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Edi, uh, Sandy. Um, I, my apologies for cutting short our open forum. There are actually many, many questions, but I think some of them are related. No? Uh, there are many questions Um. Uh, related to you know um, uh, the perverse incentives 
uh, that you know incentives uh, in our local government uh, that encourages uh, creation uh, of and division of LGUs or we mentioned this already in the discussion, the gerry gerrymandering. So, but then let me just maybe uh, as a final as a final question, um, and it, it could be also like a recap. No? Uh, I'd like to pick on one of the recommendations of uh, in the study of Dr. Justine Sikat and Dr. Pakeo. One of the recommendations is to encourage uh, amalgamation or. Uh, cooperation across different LGUs for certain functions that have spillover effects. So I, the LGC already provides for inter-LGU uh, cooperation, and we have uh, discussed about them earlier, but um, inter-LGU cooperation could be very ad hoc and subject to political alliances. I think the real, the real challenge is how to encourage uh, amalgamation when the incentives to subdivide uh, and create new jurisdictions are there. So if we cannot remove the incentives through the reformulation of the era, as uh, E.B. Sandy earlier said, you know, it's so difficult to be to reformulate the era. Uh, Miss Ira na nga si, <laughs> si E.B. Sandy daw. Uh, so if we cannot do that no, by... Uh, reformulating the era, how can we instead incentivize amalgamation? So uh, if that's all right with our resource speakers, uh, if those can be uh, your consideration for your, your, your final thoughts, you know, uh, some uh, fine points uh, for final takeaway for our participants in this uh, forum. Hello. Ano, ira eh, no? Irap, irap na irap na kami talaga. Uh, tapos NPE pa nata. Natatagalan pa eh. Yun. But you know, if Congress has the power to create, Congress also has the power to amalgamate. So nasa sa inyo naman yun eh. Pagka if you, if you put your, if Congress, you know, uh, if the axe is fallen, wala naman kami choice eh. Now, how to incentivize? Yun na nga, that's why I said, make a, make a study of SAMAL, yung before and after. Kasi doon ng proof of concept, is it really advantageous? We have to convince also. Imagine mo, elected ako, for example. I, we, we will give up this uh, jurisdiction and combine with another. Why? What's the advantage? You put yourself in their shoe. What you think is acceptable to you, that would be the best way to encourage. And yeah, this just makes it sense for it. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that very difficult question, Director Pam. <laughs> because, um, so how to incentivize? Well, as Edie Sandy said, the reality of it is changing the era formula is, is going to be very, very difficult. And what we have been doing so far for the past 30 years is that in order for, let's say, those LGUs with lower income capacity or the capacity to deliver the devolved services, these were addressed using national government programs that were directed more towards, uh, well, to assist these LGUs there. But, but we know now that that um, with this devolution transition from 2022 to 2024, as well as with the COVID pandemic, national policymakers as well are, you know, still trying to, to manage um, the COVID, which is now endemic, as well as looking, you know, on how to have debt being sustainable. So, so that's another one of my concerns, the larger picture, the bigger picture. Um, Dr. We have a forthcoming study on debt sustainability and, you know, debt to GDP ratio increased from 2019, 39.6. And then now it's going, it was um, uh, the figures here. So it's about 54.6 in 2020. And it's expected to peak according to our projections, but it's still manageable um, if there is no reversal of policies with a new administration. So we're, we're, you know, we're just vetting this and we'll be releasing this soon. 
So going back to, let's say, 20% of the national budget of 2022 was allocated for LGUs. And the national government has larger responsibilities also to get the economy growing. So in terms of incentivizing, ang haba na intro ko to incentivize, I think there could still be creative ways. The Growth Equity Fund, although it's not what E.D. Sandy would want it to be, could be a way to begin. Um, just to assist the poorer ones, the SGLG Act as well as the CBMS Act also have you know ways to improve technical capacity. But in terms of incentivizing, I think it would really have to be explored because as it is right now, the fiscal space is really small. If you take a look at 2022 budget, the priorities really were infrastructure, social welfare spending. That's what increased, as well as the increase that went to LGUs. So, so I don't know yet. We'll see first uh, the, this devolution transition. Um, so there, that's that's my rather, <laughs> yeah, it is a difficult question. I don't, you know, I can't imagine yet how this would look like, but this could be explored further um, later on. But I still would like to emphasize the need for, you know, strengthen and enhance uh, supervision of higher levels of LGUs. And, you know, if there is political will for those, those who are, you know, the newly elected officials this year, locally elected and national elected officials, you know, LGUs do contribute a lot, let's say about 4% of GDP. Um, so they can also do their part, you know. Um, the examples earlier given by Director Anna, she said the challenge was sustainability of these informal um, amalgamations. So maybe, it you know this needs to be studied further. So, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, Ida Nino, do you have? Uh, uh, any? Just uh, to add to the discussion, I think uh, we must be clear on what uh, we're referring to when it comes to uh, amalgamation. Is it really the formal or the informal one? Because the formal would refer to be the legislative uh, action, and um, we, we must understand that the fiscal viability on this uh, formal process uh, are also uh, provided under uh, the local government code that uh, it should uh, meet certain uh, standards and uh, requirements. But more importantly, is the amalgamation within the same level of, gov of local government unit? Or is it amalgamating towards a higher level of local government unit? That's another uh, 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 issue. Perhaps the, the point earlier on uh, being um, more efficient with resources that may work and of course lead to uh, uh, better management of resources if the amalgamation is within the same level of local government uh, unit and not leading towards a higher le a level of local government unit where uh, expenditure responsibilities are uh, broader. Now on uh, incentivizing, I'm not sure if there's a sure answer uh, for, for, for that uh, because we must also consider the feedback from the people, the political accountability. Are the people happy with the level of service provided to them? And because that should serve as an impetus for local governments to group together because resources will be more manageable, can lead to better results, the quality, uh, the standards of uh, a service and facility would improve. Uh, we cannot dangle an incentive uh, theoretically, uh, but that must also be felt uh, by the people and uh, by the constituencies being served uh, by the uh, local governments that will have to aggregate or will be amalgamated. Um, a quick uh, comment on fiscal capacity as determinant of ERA. I'm sure we have a lot of studies uh, to refer to, but that may have some inverse uh, relationship or perverse uh, result uh, depending on the purpose. Is it to make the uh, ERA uh, bigger for the LGU or to reduce it. So you have to consider uh, uh, these factors. Now, finally, just to comment on uh, barangays as administrative units, I think um, we, we again look at it from the uh, fiscal perspective. Is the higher LGU capable of absorbing the costs of making them uh, administrative units? We were able to look at certain estimates uh, for the Magna Carta benefits of uh, the, the barangays, and we had uh, several uh, estimations on that informing Congress uh, that it will require certain billions of pesos. And uh, certainly, 
some local governments, cities or barangays may not be able to absorb uh, such uh, uh, cost requirement if they become just uh, administrative units of, uh, of a higher level local government. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Idinino. Thank you, Iri Sandy and Dr. Justine uh, Sikat. Um, maybe I'd just like to uh, update everyone with uh, the House bills, the, measure, the House bills that are filed in Congress in relation to what we are talking about. No? So uh, there are three House bills no? and, I, and also I think like one Senate bill on LGU income uh, classification and they're now pending with a with a committee and let me just share the main features of these bills no they are the provisions are common uh, across this uh, these bills uh, so it gives the secretary of finance and i think this was raised earlier by ed sandy the secretary of finance shall have the authority to set the income ranges and undertake income reclassification once every three years and for income rec reclassification purposes uh, it defined annual regular income uh, of LGUs as the sum of locally generated revenues, the ERA, and other mandatory LGU shares under the LGC. So all others uh, uh, that are excluded would be the non-recurring receipts, you know, like uh, grants, financial assistance, loan proceeds, or proceeds from sales uh, of assets. And... Uh, maybe one interesting feature would be um, provinces, cities, and municipalities shall be, okay, based on the bill, first class provinces and cities shall have an average annual income, so this is the income requirement now, in the last three fiscal years of 800 million. <laughs> 800 million. <laughs> While first class municipalities shall have at least 90, 90 million. Okay, so maybe... Dr. Justin can do some computation if this is consistent, uh, having costed the HR <laughs> requirement of LGUs. Yeah. Okay, so I'm. Um, we sincerely wish we could respond to all the questions, but uh, we really, we have gone beyond our time. And thank you uh, to our resource persons for engaging us and also to all our participants who stayed on until the end of our uh, activity. So let me thank you again in behalf of CPBRD and the PIDS. Uh, I'd like to thank our resource persons and our participants. Let me turn you over to uh, the ED Pasagi for some announcements. Thank you, Ms. Pam. I'm sure all of us have key takeaways from the talks of Dr. Sikat, um, Director Paredes, and Director Elvina, and from the Open Forum. Should you need a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and the highlights of today's event, you may visit the CPBID, the PIDS, and the SERP portal, uh, Social Economic uh, Research Portal, uh, SERP website. Flash on screen are the web addresses. Okay, you may also watch the replay of this public webinar at the PIDS Facebook page. On behalf of the PIDS, we would like to invite you to the upcoming events. Next Thursday, March 10, 2 to 4.30 p.m. is a presentation on boosting the country's participation in services trade agreements. Please reserve your slots in Cisco WebEx platform. March 17 is another Thursday with PIDS to examine our readiness for smart cities. Again, this is via Cisco Web, WebEx 2 to 4.30 p.m. To help us improve our knowledge products and services, please answer the event survey through the Google links flashed on screen and in the chat box. E-certificates will be awarded once we receive your responses to the survey. Again, thank you for your participation, and we hope to see you in our next knowledge sharing event. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, and congratulations, Dr. Justin. Thank you, Idi Sandy. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you very much, CQBRD. My homework now, okay, Director Anna. Yes, Director Anna. My question.